Good morning, speakers. We are now open for the morning. If you want to test your slides, mic, camera, etc., please drop a note in the chat.
All right, we can see your desktop. Okay. Uh, how do I um only show one screen? So go back out of screen share, and when you start up the screen share, only select the window that you want to show. It's still your whole desktop. Um, do you have your PowerPoint open? Uh, I need to move it. I see. Oh, okay. Yeah, so if you want to try that one more time, when you do the drop down to start screen sharing, Hold on. Uh, uh, that it, you should have the option to just select the PowerPoint. I don't see that option. Um. That's okay. The main thing is that we can see your screen and that's uh, that's what's most important. Yes, I'm, I'm just trying to see. Yeah, it only allow me to screen share. I couldn't find the other options. Okay. So. Yeah, I need. So. But I won't be able to see people. Message, right? That's, yeah, that's correct. If you only have one screen, but uh, Saskia or I will mention to you if there's a question that needs to be addressed. Or I guess, um, no, it's Anton today. Mm -hmm. And now we're seeing your presenter view, not your slides. It's, <laughs> this thing is, doesn't work well with two screens currently. Uh, yeah, it can be fussy. If you bring back PowerPoint, um, I can show you the other way to open it in a single window. Um, yes. Go to slide. Yeah, so we're seeing presenter view, not the slides themselves. So if you go to slideshow at the top oh, of PowerPoint. Oh, no, I think I just need to be on the other screen. Oh, you just want to be on the other screen? Oh, no. Nope, it's... still seeing presenter mode. Hold on. I guess I need to click the button share screen. No. What nope, do you do? No presenter. So go to slideshow, the drop down menu at the top. Yeah. And then, uh, um, oh, no, that's not it. We want the slideshow in the, the ribbon bar um, where it says home, insert, draw, design. And then you want slideshow uh, down a little. Yeah, there. Slideshow. And then um, set up slideshow. And then browsed by an individual, the second option. Hmm. So this should work. Yeah, so that'll just make it in a, a window if you can't get it to be in um, not presenter mode. And this? Yeah. That's full screen. That looks right? great. Yeah, I can't see anything. That's okay. Like we'll let you know if there's anything. All right, I'm going to take you off of screen share, Jerome, while we finish getting set up for the morning. But you can go ahead and just leave that window open, and uh, then you'll just be able to bring it right back up. OK.
Good morning. Can you hear me, Anton? I can hear you, yes. Ah, mm -hmm. How are you? Pretty good. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. Waking up. <laughs> Excellent. How are you, Anton? Excited. For the conclusion day. Can you hear the chicken in the background? Uh, not right now. Oh, yeah. We have a very loud chicken now. Is it on? My... Hopefully, we'll be okay. <laughs> yeah, can get over excited hearing about all the signs. <laughs> Probably. No, but just uh, it's just one chicken that had chicks and it started to uh, uh, lay eggs again. And no, so it's especially vocal. Huh. Uh, well, okay. with the little chickens. Yeah. That's nice. <clears throat> So I won't be able to see questions because uh, we tested the setup and when I go full screen mode, I don't see the, the questions. So maybe interrupt me if something is not clear. Uh, sure. Yeah, if I see a question that's very important to answer right away, I'll let you know. Yeah, yeah. I think in most cases we can wait until uh, you know the, until you're done with your slides. Yes. So let's just make sure to leave a few minutes for questions and answers. Okay. So Michael is here. Good morning, Michael. The OCNS host, uh, is that Caitlin today? Oh, it is Caitlin today. Oh, hi, Caitlin. You? It's like the voice in, uh, have you seen Upload? It's like a new series on Amazon Prime. Oh, Amazon. no, I've heard about it, but I haven't seen it. Yeah, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it, the, the story is fun. It's like um, people, uh, well, you know, it, when you die in the future, they found a way to upload your mind to a computer. And then you live in this mar marvelous fake world um, that is designed for you. And there are those agents that are here to help you, you know, whatever problem you have. It's like it's like a voice over, an angel voice. Oh, it's like um, like Janet on the Good Place, yeah. Uh, I haven't seen that, but but yeah, you're like you're like the angel uh, that is taking care <laughs> of everyone. <laughs> well, we have to figure out the brain first to make that happen. Yeah, they have a very simple process. The the person is under a machine, and then we press a button, and the, the head disappear, and then suddenly you appear on the computer. <laughs> it looks like it explode the head. <laughs> it was a bit gross, but <laughs> I know you're passionate about the upload topic. You should watch it, Anton. It's a fun, fun show. Yeah, sounds like sounds like I would like it.
Good morning, Joel. It's good to see you this morning, or it will be in about an hour when we actually get to see you. All right, we are at T minus 30 seconds. So if you want to go ahead and get started in just a moment. Is that working? Yep, looks great. Let me know when to start. Anton, anything to say before we get started? I'm a quick park, so um, uh, good morning. Uh, oh, you are really breaking up, Anton. Good, morning. <laughs> good day, good evening. So uh, welcome to the concluding day of our workshop. Uh, it's been great to have everyone, uh, the speakers and attendees. We've had great two days. All right, well, it looks like we've lost Anton. Uh, so we'll give him a moment to reconnect. And uh, otherwise, I think, Jeremy, you can go ahead and get started in a moment. Okay. Let's give him. Oh, looks like he's reloading. Anton, are you there? No, it looks like we've lost him. Uh, if you want to go ahead and get started, uh, hopefully he will rejoin us shortly. Okay, I'll try to do my best, Anton, to start with. <laughs> uh, good morning or afternoon, everyone, uh, from wherever you are. Uh, so my talk today will be about um, the Allen Brain Observatory. Uh, so this is our attempts at um, building resources around uh, in vivo physiology. Uh, so to enable a more analysis of brain function. And uh, my talk is attempted to be an introduction to these resources. And there will be a lot more in the rest of the session about this. Um, so I hope you get out, out of it uh, a lot of positive things. And so my talk title is From Hypothesis to Data, Open to Photon Brain Observatory in System Neuroscience. Uh, there will be four parts. The first, first part I'll explain the rationale as to why we decided to build observatories. And in the second part, uh, I talk about how we built them and how we brought standardization to system neuroscience. Um, some of the scientific outcome of this observatory, although there will be a lot more in the rest of the session. And then I uh, talk a little bit about OpenScope uh, to sort of share with you this development and, and uh, update everyone on this. So, I mean, it's uh, pretty clear to everyone that our goal uh, in system neuroscience, among others, is to understand how is sensory information represented and processed in the cortex. We are especially interested in the visual cortex in, at the Allen Institute. So here I've outlined a typical 
uh, behavior task where you have a mouse on the left that is performing uh, sort of a visual discrimination task based on what he sees on the screen and decide to lick or not lick depending on the, the task that uh, we ask him to learn. And then we like to dive in deeper into the cortex. In this example here is the visual cortex and understand how the different layers work together. Uh, so to do this, uh, you need to build experimental tools. Our working hypothesis at the Atlanta Brand Observatory is that uh, a large number of in vivo experiments are required to understand how the brain works. And I think that's not um, that's uh, understandable by a lot by everyone, causing data integration issues. What I mean by data integration issues is that uh, in some cases, uh, important pieces of the puzzles are collected in different places and uh, causing uh, uh, issues of you can't relate the data set together. The task is slightly different. Sometimes the data set is too different. Uh, and so we will benefit from uh, a centralized place that uh, collect all the data for everyone. In addition, a large number of experiments are often duplicated across experimental labs. Uh, and this causes, uh, in, in one case, integration issues, as well as uh, duplication of resources uh, by the field. So uh, we hypothesize that an, an observatory model, similar to what is done in astronomy, could synergize the three main communities uh, of our fields. The experimental community that is performing experiment, uh, the technical logical community that is developing tools uh, for everyone use, and the theoretical neuroscientist community that is sort of using the data set um, uh, to make new insight. And so very often, uh, some people cover multiple hats here. But uh, what I want to sort of uh, highlight is that um, uh, we could build a better system so that all of our three main, main skills work better together. And an outcome could be to create an, a marketplace of ideas where the best ideas sort of uh, are brought up and compete with one another uh, to use these resources. This model uh, actually has been very successful in other fields, like in astronomy. Here I've um, taken our, a recent reference where we looked at the impact of a single observatory. In this example, it's the Keck, which is a double uh, telescope in Hawaii. And they counted the number of publication coming out of data set uh, of data collected by the Keck Observatory. And you see that, um, and this is uh, already 10 years old, but, but as every year passes, the number of publication coming from the observatory is in the hundreds. While the astronomy field has done this transition many decades ago, um, we think there's an opportunity to do this in system neuroscience today. Uh, so, uh, in the rest of the, in these sections, I'll talk a little bit about our effort to build such an observatory in system neuroscience. As a reminder, our goal is to understand how sensory information is represented in process in the cortex. And we want to do this at scale. So, we're talking about uh, hundreds, sometimes more, uh, thousands of experiments performed on sort of a, a multiple set of experiment or rig. Uh, for many different projects and many different purposes. So how do we do that? So what we built at the Allen Institute is what we call the Allen Brain Observatory, and it's made of many different parts. The first part for doing two-photon imaging is to start with transgenic mice. So here you see at the, on this slide a number of um, uh, transgenic mice that are expressing so GCAMP indicators. And then we built um, uh, dedicated uh, sort of rigs and surgeries and team that are each specialized to collect uh, the best data set and build uh, the, the, the best um, um, instrumental facility. So the first step is to do surgery. And so we had a team, we had now have a team that is dedicated to surgeries uh, with up to 80% success rate uh, on this surgery and sometimes more. And then the brain is going, and then the mice is going to interesting imaging where we can map the visual cortex at scale again. And uh, we can do habituation or behavior training on our clusters, followed by in vivo to photon imaging. And this is the kind of data set that are collected from these animals, uh, behavior camera and eye tracking. So most of these data sets are very typical from the field. 
And then uh, we have a, a, an additional step where we can look at the health of the tissue by reconstructing the whole brain in 3D. So this is an example that I said, uh, that is collected, and this was done multiple years ago now, where you see a mouse on the left that is uh, walking on the on wheel. This is typical two photon imaging in the middle, and then you can see high tracking uh, video on the right. So just an example. Um, and interestingly, this is a view of our facility. Uh, so on the top left, and this is especially a showcase in the surgical suite, where you have very standardized surgical equipment um, organized for reproducibility. On the right, there's an, ima an image of an intrinsic imaging camera. So uh, in some ways, these rigs look very similar to what has been done uh, more traditionally in academia, but we just duplicated them uh, for parallelization. So we have free intrinsic imaging rig today. Um, on the bottom left, this is our in vivo two photon imaging facility. Uh, there is now um, seven rigs as part of this platform. And this is on the bottom right, this is the serial two photon tomography where we can reconstruct the brain in, free, in 3D. Uh, I believe it's also seven rigs. Uh, so all, importantly, if you want to collect uh, data, data of the highest quality, you need to coordinate all of the different platform together. And so what our team has done is a standardized integrated coordinate system where mice are implanted with a, um, a head frame at very specific location um, based on brain mile lambda. This is typical in the field. But we engineer our uh, head frame implant so that uh, mice could be transferred between the different platforms with high reproducibility. So we have in, in, in a really strong internal knowledge of the 3D geometries. And then uh, each individual rig is followed and monitored regularly for uh, coordinate reliability. So this is a picture of individual radicals that are placed on each individual rig. Here, surgery, intrinsic imaging, and two photon imaging. So the same radical zoomed in. And we check every day that the coordinate system is maintained. You can see more information on this in this uh, in publication below. So this is just an illustration of the standardization we put into the system, uh, but there are many more, and I won't talk about this uh, in this talk today. But uh, I hope you find useful information in this reference. Um, as an uh, output of this process, we uh, end up with a very careful data creation process. At providing standardization and high throughput. And so this is figure here is taken from a recent Nature Neuroscience paper with Saskia and Michael as co first order, uh, which we'll speak today, uh, where you see the process, the progress of mice through the pipeline. And we know in exquisite details uh, why an individual mice is falling out of our pipeline. So I wanted you to pay attention here, but um, uh, first the numbers. So we start in, for this study, we started with more than 400 mice, which is um, probably one and a half order of magnitude larger than any typical publication. And uh, we also have a pretty good knowledge of uh, what happens to these animals. So now that I've shown you um, the, the, the pipeline that we built, and I introduced it to a little bit of the sanitization, although there's a lot more if you're interested. I'd like to briefly talk about uh, what we use this pipeline for and uh, how you can use it. So uh, the first thing that we did is to build a very standardized visual stimulus that is broken into three sessions. Um, essentially, the mouse is coming three consecutive days, and we're imaging the same neurons over and over. And we characterize the response of neurons across the entire visual cortex to uh, six different classes of stimuli. Drifting grading, steady grading, locally sparse noise for receptive field mapping, natural scenes, and natural movie for a sort of more naturalistic stimuli, and uh, some spontaneous activity. On the right, you see how the sessions are broken down. So we have what we call team A, B, and C. And we've done a fair amount of analysis on this data. Uh, this is the current experimental count. So you actually can access this, and I'll show you in a couple of slides, this data on, on, on our website. 
But we've uh, uh, recorded this, the response of neurons to this standardized stimuli in six different visual areas across the, from the layer two free to the layer six uh, in both exergery and individual neurons. So there's a, a, a wealth of, of data set available. And so as I told you, uh, you can go to your website now and access this database of cells and look at the responses of neurons. So here uh, on this website, you can see each individual experiment. This is a list of, uh, um, of, um, of experiment here and um, sort of the summary statistics of the cells that are recorded in, in, that, in that experiment. It, so one of the things that Saskia and Michael and others did uh, is to look at the responsiveness of cross stimuli. And there's a whole paper about it if you want to look into more depth. Uh, and I believe Michael will cover some of it in the next uh, session. But uh, they looked at the responsiveness of neurons uh, across uh, different classes of stimuli and found that um, neurons tend to have very different responses to the different stimuli as expected, but you cannot predict the response of a neuron, say, from uh, to natural movie by looking at the drifting reading responses. So in some sense, neurons were more complex than we expected uh, uh, from the literature. And so I, I think Michael will talk a little more about this. As well as this slide where uh, Michael compare um, uh, the response in the visual cortex with sort of uh, artificial neural network to see how complex the response in V1 is. But you get more in the next session. Inter interestingly, uh, you can install uh, a Python package on your own computer. Uh, and I've uh, added a link here. And reproduce this analysis yourself. Uh, you uh, you can build. And so here, I'm sort of a, took a screenshot of a Jupyter notebook uh, where you can look at the orientation selectivity of uh, individual cells, their uh, general preference, and uh, using Python code uh, do this analysis as well as other analysis uh, that you might be interested in. And they, actually, uh, the community has been using these resources quite extensively. This uh, list of publications actually, I actually think is probably a little outdated, but uh, still there are more than 10, 10 plus references now that are using the Allen Brain Observatory data set for different questions about plasticity or um, response, feed, uh, how the neurons respond, the, the, the neurons that do not respond uh, to the stimuli, what are they doing? So um, there's a lot more uh, in this data set that you can extract. Uh, now that I've shown you uh, what we did with this uh, data set, I have a couple of slides to sort of uh, talk about what we are doing now uh, beyond the visual coding data set that is published on our website. And so in the last few years, we've been focusing tremendously on uh, a behavior task we call detection of change. So uh, an animal is watching a stimulus and detecting when the stimulus changes. So in this example, there's very simple examples here. I'm showing grantings of different orientations. And so we train the, the mice to uh, lick when uh, the, the stimulus is changing from one orientation to the other. In the final stage of our task, it's actually images. Um, but this is just for illustration purposes. So this behavior task, where we're collecting, currently collecting data from on now, will be will be published on a website in the coming year as well. And if you are interested in more information on this task, you can uh, look at this publication um, from Marina and other people. An additional uh, uh, improvement we made to a pipeline is to have multi-plane imaging. So uh, we took the instruments from built by Gen Genelia, the, the multiscope, and integrated it into the pipeline. So now we are collecting a massive amount of data. Um, in this case, a two cortical column from the layer one to the layer five during this behavior task. And we'll release that data set as well. Uh, you'll uh, hear about our attempt at yeah, or uh, our success at electrophysiology uh, in, the, in the coming session with, from Josh. So I'm not going to cover it too much, but I just want to mention that uh, this is a big, uh, a big effort as well. So uh, now that I've shown you uh, that we've built this standardized pipeline, and then uh, you can also use it for your own purposes in some of the scientific outcome out of it, 
I wanted to briefly um, talk about OpenScope. So OpenScope is, uh, you know, and an observatory is obviously you want you doing experiment on it. And we started by doing experiment when we design internally. Uh, but now that the community is using this uh, observatory for its own analysis, there are a large number of classes of experiment where you've, in, you, you've explored a data set or you explore your own data set and you want to leverage this facility because it's, it's really a, a high throughput system designed for the community. And we thought uh, it might be time to try out this full model, astronomy model, uh, where people could just come to the to the observatory as illustrated on this picture. So you could do experiment on your own, or you can do analysis on your own in your own lab, and then uh, figure out something exciting. And you want to check it at scale. So you make a proposal to uh, a centralized observatory, as it, it pictured here, and there is a community, a, a, a committee that is a reviewing proposal coming to the observatory and provide um, detailed scientific reviews back to improve the projects. And then once the project is approved in the facility, we run it and then you get the data. That's the idea behind OpenScope. So in the last, but you know, this is new for astronomy. So in the last few years, we decided that we will try it out to see how it goes. And we're actually neuroscience is ready for a full blown observatory. So the process is a two-year process, um, and we, we went through this process six times now. So in the, in the first year, uh, you release a request for proposal, and uh, people in the community will write letter of intent. So we had a letter of intent review, followed by uh, invitation for full proposals to a project that we deem feasible on our platform. And then we go through a typical project planning process at the Allen Institute with the help of the, the, the great help of the project management team and start collecting data. And, uh, um, and after about a year, um, the uh, proposal team get the data set and, and move on to data analysis. You hear about, I, I think you hear about uh, uh, one of the successful projects that we uh, uh, went through uh, in, in one of the subsequent sessions with Blake and Joel. So in the last two years, this was essentially a pilot of the observatory model. We went through six scientific projects, uh, uh, and some of these coming from a machine learning expert, uh, as well as a mixture of internal and external scientists about um, uh, meaningfulness of stimuli in mice, uh, a lot of interest about credit assignment and predictive coding is in the community, so we got a fair amount of project on this. Um, and we even got a clinical project uh, uh, from uh, Liu Wei group at MIT. Uh, this is a, a sort of an illustration of, of where it's coming from. So we, we got an interest in the model and people proposing project coming in. And this is one sort of illustrative slides about uh, some of the results from uh, one of project led by Blake Creatures and Joel Zildeberg, where for them, we recorded data from dendrites and somas in response to uh, what we call unexpected stimuli. So in these examples, the bricks coming from the left to the right, and then uh, on uh, random frames, uh, you get unexpected stimuli where the brick is reverse direction. And so they were interested in looking at um, uh, so the implementation of error signal in dendrites and so on. Uh, but you hear more about that in subsequent sessions. So I wanted to sort of briefly share our experience uh, running what we could call one of the first open neuroscience observatory. And sort of that you get a sense of how it went, because I think as a theoretical neuroscience community outlet, uh, you, you might be interested in how this went. Um, so one of the benefit is speed. Uh, definitely, uh, data collection is faster because the whole the whole the whole pipeline is set up. Uh, standardization and quality is very high, and uh, the project management is really helpful. So uh, because at the LNC we experience with building and deploying projects on a pipeline, we can help with that process uh, tremendously. Uh, there are still challenges, uh, and I think this is something the fields need to solve in the coming year uh, for observatory models. Uh, moving large data set is still a challenge. Um, and um, 
adapting the pipeline for a new project, deploying new stimuli needs to be uh, improved. Um, and so I think some of the solution here is to entirely move processing and data storage to the cloud. Uh, I think uh, the field needs to sort of adopt new modern practices um, that are used in the industry. Uh, and so I'm hopeful actually this is happening right now. And this will help uh, observatories uh, a lot, actually. Another point, uh, education and support is important. So when a data set is published out, uh, they still need to help the teams. And so I think we need to build a, a sort of bigger community around the observatory. And so I'm hopeful that we'll be able to do that in the following years. And, uh, and one thing that we uh, uh, found is that there is often conflict between projects on, on the platforms. And so I think moving forward, dedicated instruments and staff to a community observatory will help the model tremendously. Um, and so I'm, I'm talking about this in the next slide. Because I think uh, uh, what, we, because what we've done in the last uh, three years is to test the success of an observatory model. I think we saw interest, uh, but for this to be very successful, um, I think it needs, we need to build the observatory from the start with the community. So what I mean by that is that, um, um, you know, the same way as astronomy observatory we built, you start with three components. First, you have to have the science, the community, and the fun coming together. And so from the start, uh, these are partners. Uh, whereas for the open scope observatory, the science um, and, and uh, started first and the community came later where we added the open scope component a little later. Well, you have about I think seven minutes left. Yeah, that should be good. Um, and so um, I think this should be the process moving forward to build observatory for the community. Uh, and so uh, this and this is what I envision based on my experience now running uh, this observatory and and seeing how the field is evolving. Uh, I envision that uh, we'll start by building this, this, this observatory, starting with these three components from the start. And then the neurotech community will come in uh, and provide new tools, cutting edge tools that the, the, the science needs to give access to a, a larger group. And there will be a 10 year phase for the uh, use of this, uh, of this uh, observatory because you know, technology evolves quickly in, 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 in neuroscience. And so you have to have sort of this uh, sort of span of years in mind. And then for, for the, let's say the one or two first year, the system is built, the community is starting to use it later on. So that will be when the experimental and the theoretical community comes in. And then uh, uh, probably about 10 years in, uh, you have to think about the end of life of the pipeline because the, the technology is getting expired. Um, and this is where you transition to the following observatory, similar to what astronomy is doing. During this time, the, you still need to have support on the data because it's still valuable. And, uh, and I think the theoretical neuroscience community comes in and to, to sort of milk the data set even further and allow to define the following iterations of the pipeline. So I envision that as we transition, uh, more science into observatory and neuroscience will sort of go into this mode of cycle where we build the observatory for the community and then uh, use it for about a decade and then move on to the next uh, where this take care of the people as well. So you have the, the technological community coming in and uh, helpful for building each iteration and then the support staff can transition between iterations as well as the theoretical neuroscience community can use this data set. And here I highlight a couple examples, um, like full dorsal cortex recording or full brain and medical reconstruction. These are things that we need to do today, which really need facilities. So to summarize, uh, we have built a high throughput system neuroscience pipeline for reproducible, standardized, and efficient data generation. I hope I've convinced you today that there's more resources if you want more information. Uh, we've used it to collect standardized math of functional responses. And these are available to you. Uh, and also sort of uh, try out the open scope model. You hear about one of these projects uh, later in your talk. Um, and so I've uh, sort of shared some, some of my thoughts about how to move forward with this model. 
if you're interested in this model, feel free to contact me. Uh, I'm um, actively interested in people that are supportive of the idea. Uh, I wish to thank the Allen Institute for its support and especially our founders, uh, which was tremendously helpful and impactful for this work. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jerome. Thank you very much for the excellent talk. All right. So let's uh, take a couple of questions. So there is one here um, from Joel Zildelberg. Jerome, are you imagining this purpose-built brain observatory being within the Allen Institute or as a standalone new institute initiative, perhaps funded by Paul Allen, Vulcan, or maybe with other funding? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, this is something we are actually working very actively now. Uh, and I think um, the funding cannot come exclusively from the Allen Institute because it's a community-built platform. And so I think it's important that um, the community support it. For, for it, I think it's not only for its uh, sustainability, but also for um, so that everyone that want to use it has a voice uh, on how it's run. And so I envision that moving forward, uh, this the funding will come from multiple sources. And so that's why we are, I'm very interested in people that are interested in this model, uh, because I think we could build new iterations of the observatory uh, that are sort of more focused on the community. Okay, thanks. Um, I also have a question. So, um, in your experience talking to users or prospective users, um, people who are potentially interested, um, what are the major things that they want uh, that still remain challenging for this platform? Yeah, I, I mentioned some of this in um, in my slides. I think. Um, Data processing is a big challenge. You know, for in the case of two photon imaging, uh, there's a lot of steps in processing the data, and every project sometimes needs its own um, tools. Uh, I think it's something that everyone struggle, even outside of observatories. Uh, that you you want you need to do you want to use the cutting edge processing pipeline from that is developed by another group, and so I think the field needs to come together. Uh, and using modern, for instance, Docker technology, where you can deploy code with high quality and reproducibility and facilitate, facilitate the use of these pipelines. And I envision that moving the data to the cloud and use Dockers and things like Neurocast coming from Columbia uh, could transform these platforms because you, you now you could sort of uh, just build a Jupyter notebook, share it with everyone, and then uh, modify it. And so, and also, project could help each other because now you're using the same data set, and then you say, "Hey, look, this Docker is working well, and this data can you use it?" So, I think there's many opportunities in data analysis sphere here, and I'm sure Blake and Joel could speak to that <laughs> uh, challenge. Uh, well, thanks again, Jerome. It uh, was great. So we can move to the next speaker. All right. Uh, so our next speaker is Michael Bice. Um, he's an associate investigator at the Allen Institute. He's been there since 2013. And Michael explores the implications of theories of neural processing and uh, contributes to mathematical and data analysis at the Institute. Hi, Michael. So he will tell us today about functional computation in the mouse visual cortex. Welcome, Michael. Oh, no. Oh, we can hear you. We can hear you now. Looks like he's reconnecting. We'll just give him a moment. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. We can hear you. Can you so my audio has vanished from the feed. I can't, I couldn't hear Anton. Can people hear me? Yes. Okay. Then we will continue and not worry about that. <laughs> um, all righty. So, um, yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Anton and, and, and the other organizers for inviting me. Um, so I'm going to uh, build on what Jerome said by talking about uh, some of our analysis that we've done building on uh, the Brain Observatory. So starting with the, the one of the early tools uh, that he mentioned, in particular, the two-photon calcium imaging Brain Observatory. Uh, and I want to stress that um, one of the important, and, and this was certainly a, a part of Jerome's presentation, uh, but one of the important features of this is, of course, if, if you have any doubts or concerns or, or uh, issues or differences of opinion about what I have done or what we have done, uh, you're welcome to, to take the data yourself and see how, how you handle it and, and what results you get. Uh, that's really a strength of, of what we're doing here, that everything's open, the tools are available for you, and you can just go, go, go to it yourself. So I want to start by... Uh, uh, emphasizing this aspect of the two-photon calcium imaging pipeline that Jerome mentioned, namely that we have this large set of, of um, uh, stimuli uh, that, that sort of the, the idea was to span the range of the sort of standard stimuli that people use for characterizing uh, responses in visual cortex. So you, you have your drifting and static gratings to get things like uh, orientation tuning curves, um, in addition to locally sparse noise for trying to assess receptive fields, uh, as well as natural scenes and natural movies. Um, and the idea that we had hoped to capture by, by doing this and, and using this bevy of stimuli um, was to get a, a, a functional characterization of cells across cortex. Um, so we could say, you know, in, in the ideal case, you know, show this body of stimuli, characterize the response with some model, for example, and then be able to say, you know, we have so many cells of type A and so many cells of type B, Etc., and be able to have some kind of characterization so we could start exploring what the circuit is doing. And so in particular, a lot of this is based on you know, what we were referring to as the standard model. Um, and this is the specific uh, diagram of the model we use to, take, to, to, to stand in for this. Um, the idea that you have some sort of receptive field um, that in the case of a so-called simple cell, you know, is a particular region, a spatiotemporal region uh, of the visual field that's, some, that's localized but also for complex cells, you have uh, quadrature pairs of these. And so we created this, this uh, a GLM type model that takes into account these features with the idea that we would be able to get at least most of the activity uh, and characterize most of what's going on uh, with this kind of model and then build on that. Um, not that we expected this, you know, it's, it's certainly known in the literature uh, that this is not going to be the end all be all model and be able to characterize every single cell, uh, but it'll get, it. it, it in the words of, of a referee, for example, that it would be a good start. Um, we could, if we could take this as a, a launching point and move from there for further explorations. Uh, one of the interesting things about our pipeline, of course, uh, is that we also have the running speed of the mouse in addition to the passive viewing stimuli. So uh, one of the things we did, let me go back to this model for a second. So we actually separately trained this model on the natural and artificial stimuli. So we took all of the natural stimuli together um, and used both the, the natural images and the natural movies. Um, and then we also combined all of the artificial stimuli, the, the locally sparse noise, the static gratings and the drifting gratings. And we, we trained the model separately on each body of stimuli. So what I've got here is the uh, cross-validated uh, model prediction performance uh, on held out data for the cell, comparing the natural stimulus performance with the artificial stimulus performance. Uh, and one of the things you, 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 that should be noticeable right away is the bulk of this density plot is down here near zero. So you've got plenty of cells out here in the cloud, um, so to speak, um, that are sort of what you might call respectable in the sense that, you know, if you had these kind of R values in, in, in your, your neuroscience paper, you're going to say, great, we understand these cells, here we go, uh, and, and off we go with our paper. But this is 60, or actually this, this plot is something like 30,000 cells. Um, and, and the bulk of the vast majority of them are down here near zero. This model does not work at all. So one of the things we did, so Jerome 
uh, showed a version of this uh, analysis when he talked about um, the, the different the responses to the different stimuli and the reliabilities. So one of the things we noticed is that casually looking at the data, you'd see cells that would respond during the epics of lifting gratings and respond during the epics of static gratings, but not necessarily during the others. Not that some cells didn't respond to multiple stimuli, but that you couldn't necessarily easily guess if a cell responds during the drifting grating stimulus that it's going to respond during the natural movement stimulus or, or any of the other combinations for the most part. Um, so what we want, what we did in order to try and do some functional characterization, since we couldn't use the models the way I described, since the models had such poor performance over the bulk of the data set, um, is we said, well, let's just look at the stimulus uh, categories themselves, drifting gratings, static gratings, et cetera, and look at the reliability. By reliability, I'm referring to the, the percentage of trials on which the neuron will respond significantly to its preferred stimulus. Um, and so what we did is we did a, a Gaussian mix mixture model clustering um, on that set of reliabilities across the different stimulus dimensions and then used that to classify the cells as to whether or not they responded to any of the, the different stimuli. And so in this case, we've got basically for drifting grading, static gratings, natural scenes, natural movies, there's a binary call as to whether or not it reliably responds to those, those stimuli. And importantly, most of the, well, not most, the, the plurality of cells, the largest single uh, a group, about a third of the cells, did not reliably respond to any of the stimuli. Um, so, so none of these, uh, these stimuli that are used to typically characterize uh, visual coding, uh, or excuse me, visual cortical responses, uh, drove the cells in any reliable way. We did get a reasonable number of cells that respond to everything. So this would be what you what we, we sort of characterize, uh, uh, loosely speaking, as the sort of standard model cells, the ones that respond to the the, the standard sort of uh, uh, frequency. Um, you know, gratings generate responses. Those are those are somehow related to the the natural scene and natural movie responses. Uh, the things that you sort of think of when you think of uh, uh, visual cortical responses. Uh, but we also have substantial response to things like natural movies and drifting gratings. So it looks like motion seems to be an important thing uh, in, in the mouse visual cortex. Now, this is, of course, over all of the different, uh, all of the different areas. This is the whole data set. Um, if you break this down by area, you see a very interesting pattern, namely that these none cells, so this, this gray bar here, or black, if, if you will, um, is the proportion of none cells. You see that actually grows as you move uh, across these areas. And we've organized them into some kind of hierarchy here. Uh, in this case, it's literally just organized by the number of none cells. Uh, but this is suggestive of some kind of, of successive processing. Now, one thing to note is the fraction of cells that respond to moving type stimuli, this is natural movies and natural movies and, and driven gratings. These proportions don't exactly shrink until you get to RL, whereas the other proportions get progressively smaller um, as, as you move up. And, and fortunately, these classifications are actually uh, commiserate with our model performance. So if I take the, the cells, I, the, the performance I had before, and I just pull out the cells um, that happen to, um, that got, get classified as none, sure enough, that is, a, that is a, a blob of cells that is around zero. Similarly, if I look at the cells that just respond to natural scenes and natural movies, well, sure enough, though, the, you know, th this blob is moved up along the vertical axis, but it's still basically at zero, so that's consistent. And finally, the, uh, the sort of all cells, the cells that respond to everything, now this, this is a, a scatter plot that's sort of in your respectable neuroscience territory, uh, where these kind of look like the model performances you'd expect from the standard model for, for visual cortex. Okay, now you might worry that this is a, so I'm gonna speak briefly about this, this aspect. Saskia's gonna cover this uh, in greater detail in, in her talk. Uh, but to give you a little preview, you might expect that this is a, a, a two-photon calcium imaging problem, that there's some kind of iceberg effect, for example, um, that you're not capturing all the spikes. This model performance prediction or, or, or observation is true across modalities. Uh, so if we do a similar kind of experiment with, with uh, EFIS, so this is using neuropixels, um, and what I've got across the row here is uh, a histogram of the model performance on natural stimuli, uh, the same model across these different areas. And you see the, uh, the average model performance is not terribly different. Um, and the, 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 the second line here is, the, uh, is what we call a targeted movies set. It's a similar kind of natural movie uh, data set, but it's a, a denser set of natural movies. That doesn't seem to help the model performance. Um, 
And then this is just for reference, the Brain Observatory itself, the same data I showed you. Okay, now this is not to say that the cells are not visually driven. Um, so if we calculate what's called CC max, this is a, an estimate of the maximum possible model performance that you could get for some model associated with the data. Um, you actually get very high numbers, particularly for, for uh, neuropixels. Uh, you get very high numbers in all of these regions. So there is repeatable activity, just this model is not capturing it. Um, it's a little bit lower for, um, uh, for, for the uh, uh, 2P modality, uh, but still quite high and much higher than, than the actual values we get for our model. So this actually suggests that um, one of the possible problems here is that we're not driving the, uh, well, one, the model is not, not adequate. Um, and so you might ask, well, why didn't you try a better model? And of course we did, but, of course, but, but in the case of say, you might think, well, since I'm in visual cortex, I should have some multi-layer model. It takes into account multiple synapses from retina to lateral genetic nucleus all the way up to V1. Uh, but that kind of model is just not sufficient to fit uh, or excuse me, our, the data we have, as massive as it is, is actually not sufficient to fit that, mainly because the cells are driven so sparsely that you don't get responses. And so the cells that you're actually able to model somewhat well are the cells that actually happen to be driven by whatever feature is in the, the data set. So we're in the process of trying to collect a, a follow-up data set where we're trying to just bombard. This is sort of a particle physics style experiment. Uh, just turn up, turn everything up to 11. Uh, so to speak, and this is just bombard the cell with as many natural, or many unique frames of natural movie as possible. Uh, and the idea is to do 10 consecutive sessions with 50 minutes of unique movies with a small repeated test set. Um, and what's plotted here on the, this is a schematic of that, that uh, um, experimental set, uh, of that session setup. And what's over here on the right is a sort of proof of concept with one pilot experiment we've done with nine sessions that shows we can take a multi-layer model now and actually fit it uh, and get better model performance over the uh, uh, previous kind of model. But that's that's sort of a preview of work in progress. Um, I'll have to leave you in anticipation for, for what the final results of that are going to be. Okay, so I mentioned functional uh, computation or, or functional um, organization in my title. Um, so far, I've just been talking about you know, uh, low-level models of neural response. Uh, but now I want to zoom out and talk about the bigger picture of what the circuit is actually doing. So the dominant picture of visual cortex, at least in monkey, uh, at least the ventral stream, is, is this picture of object recognition that's very much in line with, with modern deep learning. You have multiple levels uh, of computation, uh, convolution in particular, or convolutions in particular. Um, and as you move through these levels, you get a change in the neural activity the profile of neural activity such that certain things like say in this case cars versus planes uh, from this this uh, uh, graph from from this review article um, get separated in an easy way and in, in, in the case of, of, of this particular picture the idea is that you get in in some higher level uh, like like infratemporal cortex you wind up with a linearly separable representation so that all the cars are on one side of some hyperplane and all the planes are on some other side of some hyperplane, making it easy to decode that particular category. Um, and, and several uh, pieces of work, in particular, uh, this work from Dan Yemens has shown that you can train models to do object recognition, and just the features alone on the object recognition are enough to generate uh, a, a relatively simple, in this case, a, a model defined by linear regression on those features uh, that, that is good enough to, to get state of the art on predicting neural response in, in IT. And so the idea here is that the features that are necessary to perform some task are the features um, that are important for modeling uh, cortex. So the question becomes, what's the task and what does this mean for neural computation at large? So if we take the, the point of view that object recognition is a kind of task that you can think about in terms of what the, uh, the cell is doing or what the, the system is doing, what does that actually mean for our circuit? Um, and so what would, we, what would we have expected if this is the right picture of mouse cortex? So here I've, I've plotted, um, uh, these, this is, these are the layers of VGG16, uh, which is a, a, a modern and well-known uh, ImageNet trained model. Um, and I've picked out a few of the pooling layers here. 
and shown uh, for, for randomly, 25 randomly picked cells in each case, what the optimal stimuli are. And you see that the, for low, you know, lower in the network, you get relatively simple features. And the complexity of these features, of course, grows uh, as you move through the network. So, so when I'm down here at, at layer 10, I wind up with these sort of psychedelic kind of high textured goofy patterns as the patterns that optimally drive those cells rather than, rather than you know, in this, this intermediate layer, you get things that kind of look like gobblers but also look a bit more complicated uh, and extremely simple features down here. So if you ask something like, you know, what's the, the percentage of images that will generate some response in VGG16, if you take the Allen Brain Observatory natural images and you show these to VGG16, you get this decreasing response profile uh, that fewer and fewer images drive the, the response. And this is, this is to be expected uh, because, of course, what's happening in something like VGG16 is as you go through the network, you're getting more and more uh, sparse and refined features that are appropriate for the task at hand, uh, as opposed to whatever features happen to be in the, in the visual field themselves. And so it makes sense that fewer and fewer features should drive responses. Um, but of course, this is also what we see in the brain observatory that, that, that very few cells get driven by our stimuli. So we're going to ask a question using this uh, this analysis from uh, uh, that was originally uh, put together by Kriegsvorda uh, of, of comparing what's called a similarity ma matrix. And so the idea, if you're not familiar with this, is is to ask you know if I've got two different images, I'm going to look at the neural representation from each of those images, um, and I'm going to correlate that neural representation. So I have a correlation of the population activity in response to image one and in response to image two, and I do that for my entire set of images. So I get this image by image correlation matrix that is going to be a measure of the representation. It's a measure, it's a measure of the, the similarity of the neural response compared to the image. So for example, if a particular representation is supposed uh, does a good job at codifying cars versus cars versus planes, then there's going to be a high correlation in the neural outputs for everything that has cars in it. Um, similarly high for every for, for two representations that have, have planes in it, but if, if one has plane and one has a car, that representation should be far apart. And that should be reflected in the similarity matrix. Then what we're going to do is take these similarity matrices from different representations, say from a model or from the brain, and correlate them. And that measure of correlation is going to be a measure of the similarity of the representation. So we're going to use VG16 as a sort of fiducial network to, to measure this. Um, I want to, to emphasize that we can do this with your favorite off-the-shelf convolutional neural network and get similar results in terms of the qualitative statements I'm going to make. Um, so VGG16 is not special in that case. Uh, but here what I've done is I've, plot, I've taken layer 2-3 of the mouse cortex and VIS-P. I've taken the measurements from the neurons in those areas and computed this, um, um, this correlation measure um, across each layer. And you see that for most of the excitatory lines, uh, you get the maximum relationship in layer 10. And to remind you, layer 10 is the layer that produced these image, these features up here, not that produced these sort of simple like features down here. Um, and so VIS-P, uh, the excitatory cells in VIS-P are most similar to layer 10 of VGG16. And this is a trend that actually continues across most of uh, cortex, uh, or most of the areas and layers. The, the, the most similar features tend to be things that are midway through VGG16. This, this, uh, idea of being sort of higher order in this in sense of being deeper in the network is true if you use Inception, it's true if you use um, uh, ResNet, it's, it's true if you use AlexNet, it's not, it's not specific to VGG16. Okay, so middle layers have the highest values. Um, inhibitory neurons, interestingly enough, have lower values. Uh, and you might ask, well, uh, so, so something you might be, be worried about um, is that VGG16 is enormous. It's much bigger, if you count it sort of unit by unit, it's much bigger uh, than the mouse visual system. Um, so you might reasonably think that's an unfair advantage. And so I've, I've created this sort of toy model uh, that I've called LeMouse after uh, Jan LeCun's Lynette. Um, sorry. Um, and the idea here was to take something like VGG16, but shrink it down. So remove units um, in such a way that you get something that can fit in in um, mouse visual cortex. And I did this in such a way that the pooling layers roughly map to LGN, VISP, VISL, VISLI, et cetera, uh, using the, the unit counts from layer four of each of these areas from the Allen, Allen Mouse Brain Connectivity Atlas. And so I trained this model uh, on ImageNet. Um, it takes some two plus weeks on a, uh, on a 1080 Ti, or at least that's what it did take. And you get very similar results that it's, it's 
further in the network that you wind up with these, these high similarities. Um, however, this is a relatively shallow network. So one thing you might, uh, uh, or one, one, one nice question to ask is, I, you know, what features drive are, are driven by, or what neurons are driven by what features in this particular model as well. Um, and one thing that's interesting to note is you wind up with this sparsity happening very, very quickly relative to VGG16. Um, so whereas in VGG16, it took several layers to get to the point where you wind up with, with relatively small uh, percentage response to uh, percentage images generating response, this happens very quickly uh, for this Lumaus model. Um, and so this sort of um, snarky uh, question I think this leaves us uh, with is you've got a, um, a situation where the, the, the cortical computation we call deep because you have to be down here before you look like the mouse brain. Or if you have this impoverished network that has very few units, uh, it might be just pure, pure stupidity. Um, so to speak, that, that gets you down here. The, the impoverished network per forces you to make these complex features. And so you've got a question for the mouse that it could be either deep or stupid, as it were. Okay, all of that is based on object recognition. Um, and so a, a, a very important question to ask is what is the right um, task to think about? Uh, and so with a, a, a student that I met at the Center for Brains, Minds and Machines course uh, last summer, started doing this analysis where he took the, uh, the taskonomy features. Taskonomy is this, this uh, machine learning study to try and find features that were good for various tasks. Um, and he, he took the, these different features and asked which, which features for which tasks were, were good at predicting the representation you see in mouse visual cortex. Interestingly, the best things look like classification segmentation, but it should be mentioned that all of these, these tasks are, are uh, a fixed image task. They're not um, they're not based on motion and the kinds of things that are probably important for something like a mouse. Uh, and in fact, seem to be important in terms of, we, we, you know, one of the things I mentioned to you is that motion generates the, uh, uh, some of the more, some of the stronger, more reliable responses. Okay, so uh, a last couple of things, um, since I should be running out of time here, um, is we're trying to, so that, that, that the previous arguments are, are, are to the point that we need to think carefully about what task is being trained to generate the, these features and what the architecture is. So in the, in the Lumaus case, I did something sort of simple-minded. I just took standard object recognition and said, let's crush it to make it mouse-sized. Um, but now we're, we're in the middle of trying to do something a little more sophisticated. We're trying to take this work that, that Stefan mentioned, uh, Stefan Mahalas, if you were at his uh, talk a couple of days ago, uh, mentioned in terms of trying to look at the, the mesoscopic connectivity of, of the mouse visual cortex and actually build a artificial neural network that uses that structure. And so this is translated into something that kind of looks like uh, the network on the right, where because of the, the architecture that, that, that Julie and Stefan had covered uh, and others, it looks like you have some multiple sort of more parallel pathways as opposed to something um, that, that's the, the single pathway that you get for a, for a standard convolutional neural network. And so we're in the process of exploring what you get when you try to train a model like this. And just as an initial highlight, um, what I've plotted here is an initial, is the uh, similarity matrix correlation for VizP versus um, the different layers in the model. So just to, to be careful on nomenclature, everything along this axis here uh, is a area, is an anatomically labeled area in the model. What's being compared is VizP from the mouse, uh, actual mouse representation in the Allen Brain Observatory. Uh, the black line here is the initial condition, uh, just random connectivity. Um, and each colored line here is um, indicative of a particular point in training as we train it on ImageNet. And so interestingly, you find certain areas, the representation gets more similar. Uh, certainly a lot of the early layers get more similar, but there are certain layers that actually get less similar uh, as if this task is driving it away from the representation uh, that's appropriate. This doesn't, for example, happen with VGG. With VGG, what happens is what you think happens. You start with a um, a representation that, you know, random representation, and it just gets better uh, training on, on mouse cortex. So we're still trying to unravel uh, ravel these mysteries that's sort of in progress. Um, but to touch back on, on a previous statement, uh, one of the uh, goals here is to actually find an appropriate task. And so we're actually trying to, um, or we're actually aiming to, to uh, uh, enlarge the sphere of tasks beyond something simple like object recognition and think about what mouse, what mice actually do in an actual environment. So this is a, a virtual environment that's being created by some of our collaborators here. Um, 
um, where you know, the reason it looks terrible, for example, is the this is being filtered through the mouse optics. And so this is a virtual environment in which the mouse is supposed to find, you know, do some predation. Uh, yes, believe it or not, mice predate. Um, you know, try to find bugs and, and, and food and so forth. And so the idea is to, to do some training in, a, in, a, in an environment like this and see what features are appropriate for these kind of tasks. Okay, so this is a, a, a long list of co-conspirators, um, some of whom you will hear about later today. You'll hear from Blake, you'll hear, about, you'll hear from Saskia, some of whom you've already heard, uh, heard from. So I want to, so that looks like that's about my time. So I want to thank in particular Paul Allen for, for all of the opportunities that all of us have been provided. Uh, and thank you for listening. Great. That and I still have no wonderful. audio. But... Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Can you hear Anton? He's talking. No. Can you hear me? Okay, it looks like uh, Michael can hear us. Well, um, if people have questions, uh, can you please quickly pause them here and ask the question button? And, uh, uh, looks like it's just me. me. Here. Yeah, so you can go ahead and use that ask a question button to the left, audience members, and uh, type your question so that Michael can read it. We are just about out of time, so if uh, we don't have time for Michael to answer it out loud, then he can just type an answer to your question when we move on to the next presentation. We'll, we'll give a couple more minutes, see if anybody is posting a question in the ask a question box. There we go. Yeah, recurrence is a good question. Um, so we're starting with the, the things that we've started with largely for simplicity, because recurrence just adds a, a layer of complexity. Um, I, I do think, um, I guess the simple answer is yes, absolutely. I do think it will improve, it, uh, it will improve agreement. Um, the real question is, what's the right way to fit these models and what's the right um, the right set of features. And so we, we started with the, the, the simple things for basically that reason, that they are simple. Uh, they're easy to fit. You don't, you, you have less things to worry about, but this is certainly an area that, that is one of the next things to try is, is to, to increase the complexity of the models by including uh, uh, temporal dynamics, but it's not something you can just drop in a box and go. Uh, you have to sort of think carefully about how you do it. Um, and so, yeah, that I, I to answer. So Joel's asking, do, do you think the difference of the VGG and mouse net could have to do with the task? And, and yeah, that, that was the point I was trying to make, as I absolutely think the task is is important. Um, uh, I, I suspect that that, um, you know, object recognition is not what's going on, uh, at least in a in a simple way um, that that probably so, for example, an, a, an easy hypothesis to come to looking at the architecture is that each of those different pathways is actually relevant for a different kind of task. And you might ask, uh, you know, is, is the separation into parallel pathways useful for some Uber task, or are they really separate tasks that, you know, this, this pathway is useful for task one and this pathway is useful for task two or some middle ground. And we don't know yet, but that's that's the answering this question is, is what we're actually trying to get at is what's the right task uh, that's appropriate for this architecture or vice versa. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. So, uh, yeah, let's uh, move to our next speaker then. And uh, that's going to be Joel Zilbelberg.
um, a Canada Research Chair and an Assistant Professor at York University in Toronto. So Joel's group investigates questions about visual representations in the brain and learning of such representations through experience. And today he will talk to us about testing theories of sensory coding and learning with the Allen Institute's Brain Observatory. Thank you. And, uh, uh, Anton, can you can you hear and see me? Maybe just confirm. Yeah, we sure can. Yes, perfect. All right. Well, it's good to see you all. Um, and before I get started, I'll just mention that I'm um, actually looking for a new postdoc um, to work in areas somewhat related to what I'm going to talk about today. I just added this to the the sort of chat screen, specifically looking for a new postdoc to work with me and a lot of fish at U Alberta on schemes to use the brain of human experts as a teacher to show AI, uh, AI systems how to duplicate that expertise. Uh, we have a big fancy new grant to do this um, and are looking for some wizard level neuroscientists and machine learning people. Um, all right, so yeah, so please contact me if interested. And can you see my slides now, Anton? No, not yet. Uh, perfect, I need to screen share. This is my bad. And that's right here. Uh, application window. Perfect. How about now? Looks great. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Let's see it now. Um, all right. I'm going to assume. Um, actually, we're just before I go, go too far down this, can you write in chat whether you can still see my slides now that they're full screen? And then I will exit full screen, check that they are there, and then continue. Because like Michael, when I go to full screen, uh, I do not get audio through the thing. We can see them in full screen. You can. Perfect. Yeah. OK. And I do get the audio. So there you go. All right. Thanks. Sorry for the, the sort of technical uh, challenges there. But hopefully, this will, this will all work out uh, as we go on. So um, before I get too far into the science, I just want to start um, by thanking Saskia and others for, for organizing, well, and Anton and others at the Allen Institute for organizing this workshop. Uh, as I'm sure you've all noticed, these are, are really divisive times uh, for humanity. I mean this both in terms of politics, if you look around, it's, it's not a, a sort of calm, peaceful, happy time of togetherness. It's also a time when this virus is keeping us from seeing our friends, our families, uh, and our colleagues. And so in the midst of all this, um, to me at least, it's extra meaningful that you know, hundreds of people, as we are here at this meeting, can gather to talk about this, this issue of how we can bring science together uh, in service of, of humanity. So just huge thanks to, uh, to the organizers for putting this together. Now, um, the concept of, of brain observatories, which I'm going to talk about um, today, is one that, that's pretty meaningful to me personally for reasons that might not be obvious uh, to those of you who know me as a neuroscientist. Um, so if you don't know, I actually started my PhD uh, in astronomy, worked with a professor at Berkeley named Saul Perlmutter, and my first project in grad school was to try to measure the expansion rate of the universe using supernovae. Um, and in, in that first year working with Saul, he actually sent me to Hawaii to hang out at Keck and do some observing uh, of some supernova targets. Now, as you can tell, the astronomy side did not stick around very well for me. I kind of uh, quit and drifted over into neuroscience. Um, but looping back as a, as a theorist into this world of brain observatories has sort of got a, a nice uh, emotional resonance for me. So I'm really excited to um, get to work with, uh, with the brain observatory. And the reason I'm so excited about it is because this cartoon really reflects me in my day-to-day -day work uh, as a theorist. Sort of close my eyes. Okay, I don't always wear a tie, but this was the cartoon I got. Uh, so I close my eyes, think really hard about how I think things might work, uh, and I hope that I'm right. And the blindfold here uh, reflects the fact that without experimental data, uh, I really have no idea whether I'm right or not. I can guess, I can make math arguments, uh, but that's sort of the state of things. And, and of course, uh, tools like the Brain Observatory help this blindfold to come off uh, so that I can actually you know, know whether I'm, I'm having good ideas uh, or not. Now, uh, one of the, the issues that's, that's interested me for a really long time, and a lot of other neuroscientists, 
uh, you know, about which a lot of us, myself included, have theorized for a long time, mostly with our blindfolds on, is this question of how plasticity or learning is somehow coordinated between brain areas. And this cartoon here uh, from a paper from Blake uh, and, and his student Jordan uh, and Tim, Tim Lillycrap also on this paper kind of highlights this, uh, this scientific question. And so the idea is that, that sensory information comes in to the early stages uh, of, of processing, so to primary visual cortex uh, from thalamus, and then gets passed on through multiple stages of processing before reaching something like an output. So an association area that might be related to decisions or a motor output area that might be related to behaviors. So there's a long chain of processing between the input and any kind of output. And if, if the system as a whole is going to learn to do tasks better, in other words, to generate better outputs from its inputs, then any changes at one step in that chain need to be accompanied by corresponding uh, changes at other steps in the chain so that the whole system keeps working together. Otherwise, if they each updated themselves independently, things might get worse instead of better uh, just because the, the sort of synergy might be lost or the ability to work together. So the question then in, in neuroscience is how do, uh, what sort of signals are communicated between the brain areas to, to help them uh, sort of keep learning in concert. And that's sometimes known as the credit assignment problem, uh, which is just uh, asking how neurons in early sensory areas sort of know what their contributions are to uh, good or bad things at the output stage. In other words, how do those neurons get credit for successes or are blame for failures? Um, now, on the engineering side, uh, lots of people, including uh, you know, Tim and his group at DeepMind, uh, Tim Lillycrap and his, his team at DeepMind and, and others, um, have engineered really effective solutions to this credit assignment problem. Um, those have enabled really stunning technological progress, like uh, what's shown in this picture of the AlphaGo system from DeepMind uh, beating the best human uh, player at, at the really complex game of Go just something that people uh, thought would, would be uh, very far off into the future, but was recently achieved. And the key to, to this technological success and others in deep learning has been engineered solutions to the credit assignment problem. And that's sort of shown here cartoonishly. I, I took this cartoon from a paper of Tim's, but the same picture you could find elsewhere. The key to, to AlphaGo and other deep learning systems is that inputs shown here as X come into the, the network. They get processed through multiple intermediate stages uh, and then generate some outputs. In the case of AlphaGo, that would be uh, like a game move or, or rather a scoring of, of you know, how, well, basically the potential value of each possible game move that might be taken. Um, in terms of an animal, these inputs might be a visual scene and the outputs might be something like a motor action. So this, the structure mirrors brains, multiple stages of sequential processing between input and output. Uh, and in the in engineering side, the key to getting things like this to work is to train them with something called backpropagation of error, um, something you, you may have come across before. But if not, the key idea is that as shown by these, these sort of gold colored backward facing arrows, um, you take error information at the output, so at the Y stage, and send it back down through the network to communicate to the earlier stages what their role was in the, in the output error. That then leads to this formula down here with the delta W uh, for the update to each synapse in the system. And that synapse update depends on three factors that get multiplied together. The first is the neuron specific error. And that comes from just taking the output vector at the output stage Y multiplying it by these matrices B to send it back down through the hierarchy. That gets you a vector at each layer of the network that corresponds to the error associated with each neuron. That error then gets multiplied by the input to the synapse and the output from uh, the cell that that synapse is on. And those three things multiplied together tell you how to change the synapse to make it stronger or weaker. Uh, and again, in the engineered systems like AlphaGo, uh, this um, learning rule uh, is sort of highly successful at coordinating learning between multiple stages of processing. Now, of course, we're, we're neuroscientists, so we're not just interested in this engineering side. Um, and uh, for that reason, a bunch of us came together uh, somewhat recently. I say a bunch of us, it's like the you know 30 or so people listed here, uh, many of whom are, are in the audience for this talk. 
but a bunch of us got together uh, and really suffered through a week um, sitting on the beach in Barbados, talking through how we could use these successes from machine learning uh, to understand the neuroscience problems that, that have plagued us for a long time. And um, these bullet points sort of highlight like some of the ideas from, from that. Okay, good, looks like, looks like the slides are still working, perfect. So sort of hi highlight some of the, um, the ideas there uh, and, and specifically as they pertain to this credit assignment problem. Um, and so here it is. Uh, we don't know how synaptic plasticity is coordinated between different parts of the brain. That's the credit assignment thing I told you uh, about a moment ago. Deep learning systems, uh, we sort of know how to make it work. That's through backprop. And then the idea is, well, maybe we can take the ideas from deep learning and inform somehow what's happening in brains by using the, the AI systems or deep learning models as theory algorithms to make testable predictions for neuroscience uh, and then go into the biology lab test those predictions and see if we're right. That's sort of the, the overarching idea, although there's all, a lot more uh, sophisticated detail in this paper. So sort of with that idea in mind, uh, me and Blake and Tim and Yeshua, I got together and put in the open scope proposal to the Allen Institute. Um, the two individuals shown here on the right, Jay Pina and Colleen uh, Gillen are the the, the sort of trainees in our lab. Jay's a postdoc in my lab. Colleen's a, a student in Blake's lab. Uh, but they're the two who have done most of the analysis that I'll show you. Uh, so I wanted to, to um, give them some credit here, uh, specifically while I'm talking about credit assignment uh, and, and before I forget. So anyway, uh, with this idea that we could use AI systems as theory models, Blake and Tim and Yoshua and I got together, um, all theorists, um, and so we, we ourselves couldn't test these ideas, but we got together, put in the proposal to the open scope um, with the following sort of uh, ideas. The first is that we hypothesize that maybe the brain coordinates learning somehow uh, using top-down feedback signals. So from late stages of processing like association areas back to early stages like primary visual cortex. Um, that idea, of course, is, is just the idea that maybe the brain uses the same uh, mechanisms or similar ones to our deep learning uh, algorithms. Now to test this, um, we wanted to measure top-down signals, so ones from late areas back to early ones, in the mouse brain and see whether those looked like error type signals. That's what they would look like uh, in a deep learning algorithm. And um, of course, we couldn't do those measurements ourselves, so we, we put in the proposal to Jerome and the open scope, and they, they accepted our proposal and ultimately performed all of these experiments that I'll tell you about as we go. And the key test is whether uh, there are top-down signals at times when the mouse uh, makes a mistake, and whether those um, top-down signals change the way neurons respond to the stimulus. In other words, uh, do they reflect learning? And then a, a sort of secondary question, but one that I think is quite important, uh, is how does this whole mechanistic process vary between the cortical layers? In other words, layer two, three versus layer five cells. They might be doing things that are different. And in fact, our experiments suggest that they do. Okay, so um, here we've got the, this challenge. We wanna measure top-down signals, so from, from late stages back to early ones, uh, and separate them from the bottom-up signals, for example, from thalamus to V1 that are carrying visual information in the forward pass through the neural net. Now, that sounds like it should be very difficult, but there's a, a really beautiful anatomical fact that makes this actually possible to do uh, experimentally. That's what's shown here in this cartoon from, from uh, Blake and Jordan and Tim's 2017 paper, although the biology insights behind this come from Matthew Larcom's group. And that's the observation that top-down signals to pyramid cells in cortex, that's the excitatory neurons, about 80% of neurons in cortex, the top-down signals to those neurons go preferentially to their apical dendrites. It's the long one that sticks out of the cell body um, and, and branches out at the, the surface of the brain in layer one. That's where the top-down inputs go, where the bottom-up inputs tend to go to the basal dendrites, which live down next to the cell body in the deeper parts of cortex. And so schematically then, this is our experiment. We take two different mouse lines. Again, I say we here, I mean Jerome and the crew at the open scope that actually carried out these experiments. Um, take two different mouse lines. In one of those mouse lines, the layer two, three pyramid cells uh, express the calcium indicator GCAMP. That's what's shown on the left. Um, in the other mouse line, the layer five pyramid cells express the calcium indicator GCAMP. 
That's what's shown on the right. And then within those mouse lines, we can either put the imaging plane of the two photon microscope at the surface of the brain in layer one. That lets us see what these apical dendrites are doing in the labeled cells. Or we can move the imaging plane down to the cell body layer and see what the cell bodies are doing. Um, in other words, we can measure the top-down signals, uh, that's the apical dendrites, versus the, the full integration of bottom-up and top-down stuff at the soma. That's what we see down at the cell body layer. Um, whereas we want to do this while there's some sort of learning going on, right? That's the idea is that the mouse can make some mistakes and learn from them. For a host of reasons that I'm glad to talk about in, in, in the discussion period, um, we did this using an unsupervised learning framework that I'll describe here. Um, and so there's not really an active task that the mouse is doing, and they're not getting rewards or punishments. That, that has the benefit, of course, that we don't see you know, reward type signals um, in the mouse brain. Instead, the sort of learning signals are, in a sense, uncontaminated um, by reward, although there's other complications that come up. So here's what we did. We start by, by picking some visual stimuli. Uh, we picked two of them. One is this visual flow thing that I'll describe in a moment. The other is this Gabor sequence thing. And for each of those stimuli, there's, there's a really um, obvious pattern to them. So the visual flow looks like these little white squares uh, on the dark background moving in a consistent direction and a consistent speed. So it's like the optic flow that you would see if you walked along an infinitely long wall um, of glowing bricks. Uh, the other stimulus, this Gabor sequence, the consistent thing about it is that it's a repeating sequence of the same uh, locations of Gabor frames. So it goes A, B, C, D, ignore for a moment the E here, A, B, C, D, gray, A, B, C, D, gray. And every time an A comes on, those Gabors are at these, these same positions. The B has the Gabors at these other positions, C at some other positions, and D at yet some other positions. And that just repeats over and over again. And so the first thing we do is, is during six different days before the experiment starts, so before the calcium imaging, we expose the animals just to these consistent stimuli. So consistent optic flow uh, or ABCD gray, ABCD gray. So if, if they're learning uh, from experience what the structure of the world is, they should develop internal expectations after these six days that when they see, a, a, say, a, some flowing thing, it's just going to keep flowing in the same direction. And when they see a B, they're then going to see C, D, gray, A, B, C, D, gray, uh, and so on. Then during the imaging sessions, when we actually look in the mouse's brain for these calcium signals, we put in unexpected stimuli that are inconsistent with those established patterns. So in the visual flow for these inconsistent things, a quarter of those glowing uh, white blocks start moving in the wrong direction uh, at random times, or in the Gabor sequence stimulus, uh, the E frame in the sequence, uh, sorry, the D frame in the sequence is replaced with an E that has the Gabors at a completely new set of locations and an orientation that's orthogonal to the Ds. So the orientations change and the positions change uh, in the Gabor sequence, basically just breaking the repeating pattern ABCD that has been set up. And our predictions are that if the animal's learning the stimulus structure or learning something about it, we, then we might see changes over days in how the animal's neurons respond to these stimuli. And uh, if it's this kind of top-down feedback similar to backprop that's going on in the brain, then we might see strong layer one activations. Remember, that's the apical dendrites or top-down signals. We might see those strong activations at error times, and that would be the times where these unexpected stimuli dropped into our experiment. Um, this is what the visual flow stem looks like, just to make it a bit more concrete. So it's you know a bunch of stuff moving in a consistent direction, and then at some random times, a bunch of the bricks start flowing the wrong way. And then the Gabor stimulus uh, looks like this. I'll mention that. In the actual experiment, the animals don't have this green light uh, on the, the visual frame. It's just there to tell you when the violation starts uh, so that you can see it more easily. This will switch from green to red, but the animals don't actually see this colored circle. They instead see this repeating sequence of Gabor's A, B, C, D, gray, A, B, C, D, gray. Those Gabor's again defined by their, their locations. And then in the violation period, which comes up here, the fourth one, the E, 
uh, differs from the D that has been set up on the preceding patterns by both the locations of the Gabors and the orientations. Um, looking at this just once, it maybe doesn't pop out when that thing changes. I can tell you that I coded up these stimuli uh, when my son was about six months old. And so on his naps, I would like write some code and then watch these stimuli. And I was pretty sleep deprived. Uh, and I watched these movies a lot to debug them and make sure everything was working right. And when you're like a little a little zoned out with sleep deprivation and you watch these things for like 20 minutes and then the E-frame the e gets dropped in, it, it really, uh, it's noticeable. I'll tell you from my own experience at least. I'm not a mouse, but I found it um, pretty noticeable. All right, so just a reminder of the setup, we're imaging either top-down stuff, that's these layer one uh, dendrites shown here on the left are images, still frames from the dendrite recordings, uh, or we're imaging at the cell body layers. These pictures you know, on the left are also uh, still frames from the, the uh, cell body imaging. And we'll look at error and non-error times to test our predictions. These are some of the aggregate results that Jerome uh, would have already showed you. So this is uh, just pooled over every ROI in each of those brain areas and every trial. Um, what I didn't mention uh, yet, I don't think, is that we do this calcium imaging over three separate days. So again, the mice are habituated for six days to the consistent stim. Then in the imaging sessions, we put in the violations of that consistency and we have three separate experimental days on which we expose the mice to the stimulus with violations while we do the calcium imaging. Um, this is the, the sort of aggregate over all those data. The visual flow stim is on the left. The Gabor sequence stimulus is on the right. Uh, each of the four compartments for which we recorded, so apical dendrites or cell bodies for the layer two, three, and layer five pyramid cells are shown. Um, and in the visual flow condition, this vertical dashed gray line at time zero indicates the times when the the unexpected thing starts to happen, so the errors. And in the Gabor sequence plots, this little pink box shows the same thing. That's the, the time in which the uh, ABCE sequence is happening. In other words, the violation of expectation. And hopefully just at a glance, you can see that at least for some of these conditions, something happens around those error times. Uh, in the upper left, you'll see it's specifically like layer two, three, uh, apical dendrites of layer two, three cells for the visual flow condition. When the violation starts, the um, fluorescence imaging goes up so that those uh, dendrites become more active. Now, we can then break down the analysis further and look at either the consistent stimuli, which I'll show here, or the inconsistent ones that I'll show you in a moment, um, and just look at what happens over the multiple days of the experiment. What we see is that, especially for the Gabor stimulus, uh, the response, the neuronal and dendrite responses to these consistent stimuli goes down over the three recording days. That's, that's quite consistent across all the different areas from which we recorded. For the visual flow stimulus, more or less nothing, the changes between days are not significant um, with the exception of the apical dendrites of the layer five pyramid cells. But the idea, especially with the Gabor stimulus, is that as the animal gains more and more familiarity with the stem, the neurons uh, can basically just stop responding to it. And this sort of makes sense from an information theory standpoint, uh, like the old predictive coding ideas from Rao and Ballard, is that if you know that every time you see a D, you're then gonna see a gray and then you know A, B, C, D and so on, there's not really a lot of information uh, that's needed to convey that, uh, that stimulus to downstream. You just tell them, I'm gonna see an A again or a B again, instead of having to describe all the pixel values. Um, we think that for the visual flow stimulus, this process might have already saturated somewhat before our experiment started. Um, but, uh, right, because the, the sort of motion might be a bit more innate or familiar to the animal. Now, when we look at the inconsistent stimuli, that's those errors, uh, something pretty different happens. Already on day one of the experiments, we see strong error responses. That's in all of the, or, or you see some noticeable error responses, that's in every compartment except for the apical dendrites of layer five cells for visual flow. Um, but in all the others, we see error responses on day one. And in general, those grow over the multiple days of the experiments at the apical dendrites. Um, and so these plots show the magnitudes of those error responses uh, on each of the three days, day one, two, and three. 
uh, for each of the compartments. Now, one of the, the nice things, that, and, and th these plots are getting a bit messier because uh, the, the postdoc who worked on them, Jay, sent, literally like sent me these plots uh, as Michael was speaking. And so they're, they're hot off the press and not as, uh, not as polished as the others. But nonetheless, I think they're super informative. Um, so the, the beauty of the, the high quality imaging at the Allen Institute is that we can track individual ROIs. That's either a cell body for the soma imaging or a dendritic branch that we've segmented out of the movie uh, for the dendrite imaging. But we can track those individual ROIs over the multiple imaging days. And what's shown here is the uh, discriminability of the unexpected stimulus versus expected based on that uh, ROI's responses. And it's just this formula here. It's the mean response of the ROI to the unexpected stim minus the mean response to the expected stim divided by the standard deviation in the responses. And so, and we can track this quantity over the three days for each ROI. Um, and that's what's reflected by each of these lines. Each line reflects one over uh, one ROI changing over days. Um, this is neat because we can see that the individual ROIs, you know, change over days. And there's, there's a lot more statistics that we can do uh, with this. The one thing that we've gotten done so far, and again, uh, super hot off the press, like came to me as Michael was speaking, uh, are these plots shown here. And what these show is the change between sessions, so between day two and day one, uh, in that uh, sensitivity to the unexpected stim, that's the vertical axis. The horizontal axis here is the sensitivity to the unexpected stim on day one. And so what we see here is that those um, ROIs that were most sensitive to the, the unexpected stim on day one, in other words, they got the biggest error signal, they also show the biggest change in that error signal over days. It goes down the most for them. This is, is loosely consistent, I think, with what we expect in a system that's using those error signals to learn. Uh, the ones that get the biggest error signal show the biggest changes, in other words, the biggest learning between days. Um, there's lots more analysis to do, but I'm, I'm, I'll sort of summarize here. Uh, with, with at least the big picture stuff as it relates to this open data uh, workshop, which is that me, uh, Blake, and Tim, and Yoshua are a bunch of theorists, and we had this idea that the brain might use top-down feedback signals to coordinate learning, uh, but we couldn't really do anything with that idea because we don't know how to do experiments. At least I don't. Um, but through open scope, we're able to persuade uh, really like wizard-level experts to measure these things for us. Um, and at least in this unsupervised learning setup, which you know has some benefits, but also some caveats that we can discuss, uh, we see those top-down signals grow over days in response to unexpected stimuli uh, and shrink over days in response to the expected stimulus. Um, so, some of these changes over days look, at least at, at, uh, at um, the level I've described today, look like what we'd expect from a system learning from those errors. Um, there are some differences between layer five and layer two, three cells that still need to be fully fleshed out. Um, for those of you who think these look like interesting data, uh, they will be publicly available. That's one of the beauties of OpenScope is that we, the proposers, got first crack at analyzing the data. Um, and you know, we designed the, the experiments and, and sort of set up the analysis frameworks. So that seems kind of fair. Uh, but then um, soon, like, like uh, likely this calendar year, we will share all of our analysis code and all of the data so that you can check for yourselves whether we did it right and you can do other analyses uh, that we were not clever enough to think of. Um, and so the, the hope is that you know, others in the community can make use of these, these data that we've collected for this project uh, and that something like OpenScope might continue and that, that other theory-driven experiments uh, might be proposed. Um, and I'll end by just echoing um, that uh, I share Jerome's enthusiasm for the OpenScope type framework. And I'm definitely enthusiastic to work with Jerome and anyone else who, who uh, is interested in, in trying to set up uh, at larger scale and maybe at multiple sites um, an OpenScope type observatory. I think there's a ton of value for, for the community. Uh, and I would like to see, to see that uh, continue. All right, thanks. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Joel for the excellent talk. That was great. So um, uh, yeah, please uh, ask questions here. We can take a couple minutes for questions. Um, let me start. So 
Joel, uh, I'm curious how consistent were uh, the observations across neurons uh, within a given population. So these trends that you described for the dendrites and yeah. the stoma of um, layer two, three or layer five neurons, uh, did all layer two, three neurons do the same thing? Did all layer five neurons do the same thing or it was like uh, mixed? Yeah, so um, I have not shown you all of the plots for every ROI because there's a lot of them and it gets messy. These plots are, are of the ones I put in this talk, the, the ones that speak most to that question. Um, so here, each line with a different color represents one ROI. And uh, it again shows sort of their discriminability, how well that ROI can discriminate unexpected versus expected stimuli. It uh, shows that as a, as a function of day. So day one, two, three. Um, again, for each of the four compartments. So layer two, three apical dendrites or layer five apical dendrites and then the cell bodies. Um, you can see there is a lot of variability between ROIs. They don't all do the same thing. Uh, the trends over days in many ways are shared between ROIs. So at the apical dendrites, for example, that's those upper plots. Uh, most of the lines go up uh, for layer two, three and layer five. So that's uh, a trend that's consistent between ROIs, although not shared universally. If you look down at the cell bodies, there's also a trend that's evident, uh, which is convergence to zero. So between day one and two, most of those lines go from wherever they started uh, towards zero. So the magnitude of this discriminability goes down, uh, although the sign is different for different ROIs. Um, so sorry to sound like a politician, but the answer to your question is, uh, yeah, there's some consistency, but it's uh, there's also a lot of variability. Um, didn't mean to waffle so much there. <laughs> that's uh, that's biology. That's how it works. <laughs> all right. Thanks. Um, one other question. I'm uh, curious. So uh, we all here are enthusiastic about the open scope um, uh, experimental model. And uh, well, you managed to do an experiment uh, that seems to be good for your purposes. On the other hand, I'm sure you uh, you could have. Um, prefer to do maybe some some other experiments that could be even more suitable. So what is your dream experiment uh, on uh, open scope brain observatory if you could have anything you want there? Yeah, so the Jerome and I have actually discussed this a little bit. Um, and uh, and I'll, I'll, so I mentioned some stuff that's, that's actually in the near term like feasible um, experiment, I think. So. One nice thing that the drums showed me are simultaneous or near simultaneous multiplane imaging. So in principle, we could see apical dendrites and cell bodies of layer two, three pyramid cells in primary visual cortex and in a bunch of higher order visual areas, um, essentially at the same time. Uh, that would let us effectively, especially if we could do this with voltage imaging, which is faster, that would let us track the flow of this top-down information. So you might see it arise in association area, cell body, then see the apical dendrites of the layer two, three pyramids light up. Uh, that sort of time difference would tell you that it was a top-down flow between those, or at least strongly suggested. Um, and so in terms of the like imaging type setup, yeah, simultaneous multiplane imaging with fast voltage uh, sensors, I think would be beautiful. Um, in terms of like what the animals are doing during the imaging, some sort of um, supervised task that, that might let us test the sort of reward-based learning um, analogs to the unsupervised, like learning through familiarity stuff that we looked at here, I think would be super interesting. So imagine a, a mouse learning to, to lick when a picture of Jerome comes up, withhold their licking when it's anyone else, we could make the task hard by letting Jerome grow a big COVID beard like the one I shaved off this morning or, you know, put a funny eyeglasses on him or something. Um, so the task could be arbitrarily hard and we could see if then, you know, when they make a mistake and don't get the reward, do we see these top down flows uh, of information uh, to primary visual cortex? And specifically, do we see the biggest error signals um, being sent to those neurons that were most responsible for the mouse getting it wrong. So if we knew, say, the feature selectivity of each of these V1 neurons, uh, we could make informed guesses about which ones um, sort of should not have spiked in order for the animal to do a better job on the task. Um, and then we, we would hypothesize that they should be getting the biggest error signals. 
So uh, yeah, so the dream experiment is like basically more of the same, um, but the overall framework, I think, of looking at the top-down signals uh, when there are errors is, uh, is pretty powerful. Okay, okay. All right, thanks, Joel. So we are eaten into the break time a little bit, but let's take one last question before we break. So uh, from Vincent Chien, regarding the direction of error signal, that is bottom up, top down. Do machine learning and predictive coding have opposite opinion? Sorry, can you repeat that last part? Do machine learning and predictive coding have opposite opinions? Ah, uh, opinions on what those directions should be. So um, that's a really good question. The answer is sort of. So um, if you look at, at sort of the most uh, commonly used feed forward artificial neural nets, they do, you know, take in an image, send descriptions of that image up to the later layers, and then send the errors back down. Um, that's one sort of direction of flow, so information and error. The old Rao Ballard predictive coding ideas do have the opposite direction of flow, which is that at each stage you subtract off the prediction from the, the later stage, the, so predictions come down, you subtract it off and send the errors up through the hierarchy. That looks like something that would be opposite to the feedforward neural nets. There's some really beautiful theory work from Rafal Bogach uh, that's quite recent that shows that those are, can be essentially equivalent, which is to say that you can do deep learning using the error signals in a predictive coding network. So then the, the error that would arise that gets sent on to the next stage is also the learning signal. Um, and so it, it's, unclear whether you really make different predictions for like deep learning versus predictive coding because Rafal has shown that deep learning can be implemented by predictive coding. Um, and so in some sense, the directions of flow of error versus non-error information are, uh, are not as tightly constrained by the theory models as we might have thought. Okay, all right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joel. Uh, it was great. Uh, so um, we will break now. Uh, we have 20 minutes. Uh, and the uh, next talk will be by Blake Richards. Uh, it will start at 10 AM Pacific time. So see you all back here in 20 minutes. Blake, Saskia, and Josh, if you want to test your mic, camera, and screen share, I will be here to bring you up and do that. Hello. Hello, oh, I can see and hear you. Off to a great start. Great. Let's give this a shot. This one. 
and looks great. All right, you can see it, so I can't see you, but I can hear you. Can you see my yeah, mouth? Yeah, we see your slides in full screen. Great. Awesome. Great. Um, now I want to. Did I stop screen sharing? Great. Yeah. All right. And I can turn everything off. Do I? Oh. Josh or Blake, you're also welcome to come test your slides and screen share.
We're at just under five minutes until we're going to get started again. Hello. Hi. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and test that screen share. OK, let's do it. Uh, so there's that. And share screen. Uh, OK, I'll share share screen. There we go. And now, if I come down here, you can see my slides, I take it? We sure can. Looks great. OK, excellent. All right, I'm mm. going to take you back out of screen share for a moment, just uh, sure. so we can get back started. And uh, we have a couple minutes until the session officially begins. We want to give great. you a few minutes to come back. And so just to clarify uh, the length, I'm booked for 30 minutes, but I should leave five minutes for questions, should I? You or However much time you want to leave for questions. Okay. But yes, very good. the 30 minutes does include your time for questions. Yep. Great. Thanks. All right. Hello. Hello, everyone. Can uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Great. All right. Well, let's uh, go ahead and get started with our uh, final session of this workshop. And our next speaker is Blake Richards. Hi, Blake. Great to have you. All right, so uh, Blake is an assistant professor in the Montreal Neurological Institute and the School of Computer Science at McGill University and a core faculty member at the Quebec Artificial Intelligence Institute. Uh, his group studies general principles of learning and memory in neural networks with the ultimate goal of understanding how real and artificial brains can optimize behavior. And today he'll tell us about explorations of self-supervised learning in the neocortex using open data. Welcome, Blake. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to join you here virtually. And uh, I'm very happy to share the data that I'm about to show you with all of you. Um, and uh, thanks uh, also to Joel Zalberberg, my colleague, for his uh, great talk before me. Um, I think it sets the stage well for uh, some of what I'm going to talk about now. So um, indeed, as uh, Anton mentioned, I'm going to 
discuss uh, some explorations that we've been engaged in of looking for signs of self-supervised learning in the neocortex using some of the open data from the Allen, Bra Allen Institute for Brain Science. Um, so uh, to, to kind of motivate um, what I'm about to show you, uh, the sort of one of the sort of philosophical components of a lot of the research I do is the idea that uh, understanding brains, and I will leave the word understanding undefined uh, for the time being, because that's a much longer discussion, but understanding brains is not necessarily something that we can do simply by looking for correlations uh, between activity and stimuli and stuff like that. And um, really, we can see this when we look at what uh, we have with artificial neural networks, which, you know, obviously there are many differences between artificial neural networks and real brains, but artificial neural networks share some basic algorithmic level properties with real brains. They uh, engage in parallel processing in a highly distributed fashion using so simple units, each of which themselves engage in relatively straightforward integration, um, linear and nonlinear integration properties. Uh, or oh, sorry, um, computations, um, but together they perform um, impressive functions. And when we look at how we understand artificial neural networks, it can be very hard, much to the chagrin of some people in the explainable AI world, to understand what individual units in artificial neural networks are doing. And instead, the way in which we get at understanding artificial neural networks is ultimately with three components that we design in them. Um, those three components being the objective function that the network is trying to optimize on, the architecture of the network, so how all of the units are connected to one another, how different modules are connected to one another, and how sensory and or behavioral information flows in and out of these systems, um, and the learning rules which determine how the system can actually update its synapses in order to either climb an objective function or go down a loss function. And so um, one of the things that I'm interested in is the idea that we could actually try to understand the brain in a similar way using similar concepts and similar tools. And what I'm going to show you today is kind of some uh, of the attempts that my lab's been engaged in to do this with respect to the question of self-supervised learning. So um, specifically what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about two separate but related questions. The first is, can we find an objective function that encourages a good match to the representational structures of most visual cortex? And here's where the Allen Brain Observatory data comes in, because to do this, we're going to use all of the open source data that the Allen provides of responses to natural videos in mouse cortex. Um, and then the second component of this is if we use more realistic network architectures when we're looking at how objective functions lead to representational matches, can we get better matches to the neural data? So really what I'm trying to do here is link together the, of the two components I just showed you, the, the objective functions and the, and the architectures. Um, I'm leaving aside in this talk the question of the learning rule, though it interests me greatly. That's not what we're going to touch on here. So let's start with this first question. Can we find an objective function that encourages good matches to mouse visual cortex? So in thinking about what objective function to use, uh, I was have been for a long time very interested in the question of whether or not a predictive objective is what we actually want. So many people are familiar with research using deep neural networks where they compare deep neural networks trained on supervised image categorization tasks to the representations that exist in uh, in the brain and usually in primate visual uh, ventral visual stream. But people have also done similar things in uh, auditory tasks. And uh, generally, though, they, they use supervised training objectives where you provide some stimulus and some target and the network learns to give the right target given the stimulus. But um, I'm very interested in the idea that the brain might use predictive objectives. Now this is a very old idea. It goes back decades, decades, well more than decades in fact. Helmholtz 
arguably had within his first, uh, in some of his work, some of the initial kernels of this idea. But the, the core idea is basically that if you are some agent in a world and you uh, have a model that allows you to predict the future stimulus that you're going to get based on the previous stimulus you've received, that suggests that you must have, in fact, good have captured good latent variables for describing the structure of the world. So for example, if you see a frog start to jump and you see it extend its legs and move upwards, if you've got a good model of the world that tells you that the frog is a coherent object, that it moves with a particular um, you know, bounce to it, that it has a, probably a particular weight so you can predict the arc of its fall back down to the earth, you can say something about how its limbs are going to move, etc. Um, if you can make that prediction and you can visualize what that trajectory is going to be or, or predict it as it's unrolling, it suggests you've actually got a pretty good model of the frog within your brain. And so in that case, potentially one of the ways to learn about the structure of the world and to develop good latent variables in your representations for decision making is in fact to simply try to predict upcoming stimuli. And uh, this then is the idea that what you can do is something that some people call unsupervised learning, others call self-supervised learning, which is that you are going to try to predict something about the future representations you're going to re receive um, using previous representations. And there's a whole host of different predictive objectives that we can use and a whole set of different ways that we can do this, but I'm interested in potentially a broad class of objectives here. Now, the one I'm going to focus on in this talk is a, it comes from work in something called contrastive predictive coding. And this one is interesting because um, how it works is unlike other predictive loss functions or unsupervised loss functions that um, attempt to actually predict the low level data. So they try to predict the stimulus, literally that the agent or the animal is gonna receive, um, such as an image or a sound. What contrastive predictive coding and a variety of related algorithms do is they actually try to predict in latent space. So here you've got an example from a contrastive predictive coding paper um, in the machine learning world from Han et al. that's used to learn off of video uh, images in which uh, we base a lot of the work that I'm gonna show you now on. And so what happens is this is an illustration of a neural network rolled out through time. So we've got video segments here that are fed into a convolutional neural network that convolutional neural network produces a set of latent variables and a tensor that is called ZT to indicate the time step. And uh, that tensor then also projects up to a recurrent neural network that communicates with a context generating network. Uh, and the context generating network is responsible for generating predictions based upon previous time steps about what latent variables, the Zs, you're going to see in the future time steps. So again, what, what's, what's I think important about this is that it's not doing predictions at the pixel level. It's not actually trying to predict the video frames. It's trying to predict what the convolutional neural network is going to produce in response to the video frames. And this is maybe important when we think about the brain because, I mean, it's not impossible, but it seems unlikely, for example, that our brains literally try to predict retinal activity. Uh, though that might actually be the case. I, I think th there's an argument to be made that it makes a lot more sense that what's happening is, is the brain is trying to predict its own, like let's say in the neocortex, it's trying to predict neocortical activity. Um, and so the way that uh, contrastive predictive coding works is that you get what we call the positive example, which is the actual input, uh, sorry, the actual output from the convolutional neural network here. And you're going to compare it to the prediction Z hat that was generated by the context module. And at the same time, you're also going to look at negative examples. These are other Zs that were generated in other points in time that are not the correct ZT for T plus one for this particular time step. So the loss function 
So here, I apologize for the flipping between terminology, but here I'm going to talk now about a loss function that's being minimized rather than an objective function that's being maximized. Uh, and I apologize for the tractor that's driving by my house right now. That's unexpected. Uh, the loss function that we're going to minimize is shown right here. So what you do is you take the uh, some measurement of similarity between the prediction and the actual input you got. Uh, it can be just the dot product. Uh, take the exponent of that, divide that by the sum across all of your negative examples of the match, uh, take the log of that ratio, and then uh, that's what you're trying to minimize. Now, what that means is, and this is why it's called contrastive uh, coding, contrastive predictive coding, is that you don't just want to minimize the difference between your prediction and your uh, data, which is what you do, for example, in the kind of traditional Rao and Dao uh, Rao and Ballard model, where you get a prediction, you get uh, uh, some sensory stimuli, and you look at the difference between those, and you just want to minimize your prediction error. Here, what's happening is that you're going to look at the match to your positive data, the match to your negative data, you're going to contrast those things, and you're going to try to make it so that your predictions match the positive data as much as possible while minimizing the match to the negative data. And this um, has turned out to be a general approach in machine learning that's actually very effective for unsupervised or self-supervised learning and has led to some of the best results um, to date in actually learning off of pure sensory streams and developing representations that can then be used for downstream tasks, whether it's RL or uh, image uh, categorization or anything like that. You know, we're, we're at the point now where, in fact, with similar approaches to this, um, people have shown that you can get um, almost up to the same level of performance as a supervised uh, network trained on ImageNet, just in a purely unsupervised manner. So this is a potentially an exciting direction to go in, and this is what we're going to be exploring here. Now, um, the particular architecture that we're going to use in the first bit of data that I'm going to show you here is um, the following. We took a classic convolutional neural network, VGG16. It's got then a recurrent neural network on top. So the VGG16 is receiving midi video frames. It's generating these uh, latent space uh, variable Z. And then we're going to have this context module that has to predict the uh, Z T plus one. Uh, and it's going to contrast the positive and the negative examples and learn to maximize the match to this while minimizing the match to this. And then the data that we're going to compare to is data from the Allen Brayton Observatory. So many of you are surely familiar with this, so I'm not going to belabor it. But uh, basically, these are. Uh, two photon imaging uh, data sets where they've collected um, many, many, many neurons as mice were presented with many different stimulus types. There's all sorts of very careful experimental controls to make sure that the, uh, it's, that the data is very clean and, and precise. And I can say, you know, every time I work with Alan data, it's just wonderful. It's a real pleasure to work with. Mm. And um, they presented a bunch of different stimuli to these animals to these animals, including um, movies, natural movies. So this is what we use in this work because, um, as has been noted by De Vries et al., um, natural movies tend to elicit um, very, well, not very, but uh, good responses from neurons in those visual cortex. Um, and we're also interested in this from this question of, like, can you predict future frames from previous frames as the general structure for potentially how cortex might be working? Um, and then the areas that we're going to explore are shown here. So in addition to primary visual cortex, we're going to look at some of the uh, higher order visual areas, LM, AL, RL, AM, and PM, that uh, sit around primary visual cortex in those frame. Now, the way that we're going to compare a neural network trained with a particular objective function to the brain is using representational similarity analysis. So the way that this works is uh, Basically, that you're going to get, so, so you present the movie to the animal. You've got, say, different responses from different neurons here. I'm showing it in three-dimensional space so that we can all understand it. Um, so this would, of course, be a dimension equal to the number of neurons, though. So for each uh, video frame, you're going to get a response from the neurons, which gives you some trajectory through this space. We can take those responses and turn it into a matrix here where we've got neurons along the columns and frames along the rows. 
And if we then square that matrix, uh, what we're going to get is uh, we're just going to have the uh, frames. So we're going to basically be looking at the correlation in the response vectors here, because we're literally just, we're not actually taking the correlation, I should say, it's, it's literally just the uh, product of these things. But so we're taking the dot product of each of the response vectors across neurons um, with the response vectors to all the other frames. And that gives us this matrix of the, those dot product matches, which we then call our representational similarity matrix. And so you can do that both for real brain data and for an artificial neural network. And that will then give you uh, a set of representational similarity matrices, one for your real brain data and one for your artificial neural network. And you can then compare those and just ask, what is the correlation between those representational similarity matrices? And um, as a sanity check to show that this is not an unreasonable way to compare representations between networks, if you do this between mice, so you don't compare a neural network to a mouse, but you compare a mouse to a mouse, and you look across brain regions, what you can see is that indeed uh, brain regions tend to map to themselves with this metric. So here you're looking at the correlation in representational similarity matrices when we compare, say, primary visual cortex with the other regions. And you can see that the highest correlation of primary visual cortex RSMs um, in other mice is with primary visual cortex of other mice. And that nice diagonal band shows that this is uh, at least capturing some salient aspects about the representational structure in each of these brain regions. Now, the way that we then measure this is we've got that neural network and we can look across all of the layers. Uh, so most of these layers are in the convolutional neural network and then the top layer is the recurrent neural network. And what we can do is we measure this RSM correlation, um, but to, to actually put a, a single number on it that, that makes some sense, um, what we do is we compare to the noise ceiling. So down here you have shuffled data, which is of course leads to no correlations. Um, the gray band shows what happens when you get uh, just the pixel level correlations. Uh, so that suggests, you know, just the level of correlation that you'd get purely by virtue of the properties of the visual stimuli themselves. And then uh, the noise ceiling is what happens when you correlate the neurons' responses with themselves. So that's, of course, the very best that you could do. And uh, so what we do then is we express all of the results as a percentage of the explainable variance, uh, that is, as a percentage of the noise ceiling. And to make this easy in this talk, just FYI, and I'll come back to this question in a bit, what, we, what I'm always going to do is I'm going to show you the um, level uh, for the best layer. And we can come back to the question of what happens in other layers later. But um, all, whenever I show you these numbers, this is going to be the best layer percentage of the, represent, of the noise ceiling level. Okay, so here what we find in V1, first of all, um, is that when we look at a network that hasn't been trained, um, we already get some uh, non-trivial degree of uh, representational similarity match to most primary visual cortex. And that's undoubtedly because of the structure of the convolutional neural network. If you take a truly just random projection, you don't get that match at all. But the convolutional neural network itself captures things like the retinotopic mapping, the equivariance, et cetera, of visual cortex. And so naturally, even with untrained weights, you get some um, non-trivial uh, representational similarity match. But when we train the network with the contrastive predictive cost function on a set of natural movies, then we end up improving the representational similarity match by a significant amount um, to primary visual cortex, suggesting that as the CPC loss kind of works its way through the network and alters the representations, you end up getting representations that are indeed a better match to mouse visual cortex. When we look at some of the higher order areas, in the lateral areas, we saw a very similar effect. So in AL and uh, LM, we saw uh, increases uh, against the untrained network. Um, we saw this for RL as well. For PM, we didn't see as big of a jump. Now, partially this is because uh, 
the untrained network already matched PM very well, uh, but there was a little bit of a jump. Interestingly, with AM, uh, there wasn't that good a match in the untrained network to begin with, and we didn't see any improvement at all. So that shows that, in fact, in fact, we actually saw a little drop. And when you look at the representational similarity matches the network trains, um, you you see this slight decrease in the in the match. Um, so that suggests that uh, at first pass, it would seem like this cost function maybe isn't helping with this area. And indeed, I've given other talks on some of this data where I've suggested maybe more dorsal areas or something like that don't match this uh, predictive cost function as well. But I'm going to return to that point in a second when we move on to network architectures. For now, right, just what... about 10 minutes. Great, thank you. For now, what I'll just say is that these results show that a network trained with the contrastive predictive coding loss function can develop representations that are a better fit to most visual cortex than randomly initialized networks. And this suggests that to some extent, um, cortex may be using contrastive comparisons in latent space, uh, predictive contrastive comparisons to learn its model of the world. Now, indeed, I think what's exciting as well is that two recent papers in macaque and human have come to similar results. Um, papers from uh, the Yamans lab and the Conkle lab have shown that um, when you do this, a similar, they didn't use the exact same uh, methodology we did here, but it's a very similar set of cost functions, very similar principle of contrastive predictions in latent space. Uh, they can get better representational matches to the ventral visual stream of humans and macaques uh, and they get better matches than you get with supervised training, which I think is um, very interesting and nice to see. So can we find an objective function that encourages good matches to the representational structure of mouse visual cortex? As a preliminary answer, yes. Now, obviously we hope to get better and eventually what we'd like to do is to get to the noise ceiling, but uh, all things in due course. Now, the next question is, can a more realistic network architecture improve the match to neural data? So this was the architecture we were using. As a reminder, we had this VGG16 backbone with a recurrent neural network on top, and that's obviously not the structure of mouse visual cortex. So what happens if we use a more realistic network architecture, where we look at the fact that, for example, primary visual cortex projects directly to all of these regions? And in fact, and this is the key thing that I want to highlight here, you essentially have a bunch of parallel streams of, in, of information processing rather than this one grand hierarchy as you have in VGG16. So um, thanks to our uh, collaborators, uh, many of whom have given talks here, uh, Michael Buis, Stefan Mahalas, Graham Taylor, Eric Shi Brown, Iris uh, Jiang Hyong Shi, and Brian Tripp. Um, so it turned out they, we, we were speaking to them one day and it turned out they had been developing a network a convolutional neural network based on mouse visual cortex. And the architecture of that is illustrated here. So we've got images fed in at some kind of retinal layer, and then there's uh, input through a sort of LGN layer to visual cortex, and then uh, you know four, five different parallel pathways of information processing. And um, this, they also do a bunch of controls, uh, which I think Stefan has talked about otherwise, uh, and which I don't have time to go over here, but to make this match the structure of most visual cortex. So we wanted to know if we trained this network architecture with the contrastive predictive cost function, um, what would happen to some of those representational matches? Now, what we saw in primary visual cortex, for example, was that there was basically no difference in terms of the best performance for uh, when we look at VGG16 compared to uh, this mouse net architecture. And it was a similar story um, in several brain regions. We got slightly better matches to AL, though it was very noisy, about the same to LM, about the same to RL, and PM, but then what was interesting is we saw this big increase in the match to AM. And um, that suggests that one of the things that was missing in the initial training that we did of that VGG16 uh, network was that um, we were we were basically funneling everything through a single pathway. And, and I guess something about the representations in AM actually depend on there being parallel pathways of information processing. Um, so this is kind of a summary slide of that. So you can see that across the different regions, we've got this big jump in AM. So something about the way in which the cost function intersects with the parallel architecture is 
um, important for developing those representational matches. Now, the caveat to this that I want to be clear on is that in all these situations, I'm plotting for you the representational similarity match of the best layer in the neural network. And so in the case of mouse net, you can naturally ask, is the best layer equal to the equivalent anatomical layer? And the answer is no. We actually saw in this case that a lot of our best matches were still coming out late in the hierarchy of the model. Um, and in particular, like with AM, it was on one of those parallel pathways uh, higher in the model that didn't actually correspond to um, AM itself in the, uh, in the original setup. Um, so there's some additional work to do here. The one thing that, you know, right off the top of my head that I've discussed with my postdoc, I think is important to recognize is that uh, this mouse net architecture, though much more realistic, um, doesn't have recurrence within the layers. And I suspect that that might be a key part to how some of these networks uh, operate. And in fact, say, if you take primary visual cortex, maybe that recurrence and, and even doing predictions within that layer, as Joel showed in his data, there's, there's evidence that primary visual cortex is interested in predictive um, questions. So maybe it needs to have its own recurrent circuit doing predictions there in order to see an actual anatomical match. Up. But nonetheless, I think it's interesting that when we add these parallel pathways, we can then improve the match in areas that previously had poor matches. So these results show the network with a different architecture can improve the fit to most visual cortex. And it suggests that um, when we do this kind of work where we're looking at objective functions to explain cortex, we do need to carefully consider the architecture of the model. Um, and this is something people already knew, but it's another uh, kind of clear, clarity on that. So can a more realistic network architecture improve the matched neural data? Preliminary answer, yes, but we need to solve this question of why the anatomical regions don't necessarily line up. Um, and so uh, just to summarize, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of work to do in this sphere. I personally think that this is a very nice way to try to understand what's going on in these regions, because I think, you know, if you, if, if you look at most primary visual cortex, like people like to tease sometimes, they're like, is it even a visual region? But of course, it's a visual region, but they say that because it gets a lot of other things, motor information, probably other sensory modalities. There's all sorts of complex things going on. And I do think that it can be difficult to, in human words, say like this region does this, this region does that, these neurons do this, these neurons do that. But if instead we can map out the brain using objective functions and we can say these regions are optimizing on these sorts of questions, these regions are optimizing on these questions, here's the architecture that allows them to work together in such a way that we might actually get a really good understanding of some of these networks. So um, to cap off, thanks very much to Shahab Bakhtiari, who is the postdoc in my lab, who conducted uh, almost all of the work that I showed you here. Um, except, of course, for building MouseNet, thank you to our collaborators for sharing that with us. It really is wonderful um, to have science be co just collaborative and collegial like this. And thank you to the Allen Brain Observatory. The, the Having this open data is just so wonderful, and it really is a game changer for computational neuroscientists like myself. Um, and thanks to our funding bodies, of course, and you for listening. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Blake. Uh, that was great. Excellent talk. Um, so we don't have much time left, but let's uh, maybe try to answer a couple questions quickly. So the first question uh, from Jerome, have you looked at layer difference in latent space match strengths? I'm interested in deeper versus superficial layers in particular. That's a really good question. Um, it is actually one of the things I have asked Shahab to do next. Uh, so I don't have an answer for you yet, but we will have an answer soon. I think that um, looking at those layer differences is surely going to be very important because um, as we know from our uh, open scope data, layer five and layer two, three can do some very different things when it comes to um, unpredicted stimuli. Thank you. Okay. And uh, last question. Uh, can you test your cortical area predicted self idea by training the CPC uh, also on the neural data? For example, predict the next frame of calcium imaging. Then compare representations of CPC that predict uh, primary visual cortex uh, with AL and so on to each of those brain areas. Um, I mean, 
so I understand the question, but I'm not 100% sure on the goal. So certainly we could train CPC on the calcium imaging data to try to predict the frames. And I suppose an interesting question would be, like, I guess the idea is that that is then like being a higher order area that's receiving that data. Um, but of course, if you're training on the calcium imaging data, there's all sorts of additional components in the image that are probably unrelated to what neurons receiving signals from that circuit would receive. All things about, you know, the calcium indicator itself, the shape of neurons, stuff like that. And so the latent space representations, if trained on those images, would probably look a lot like um, the, well, it would contain all these additional factors in the, in the latent space. Maybe what we could do is just take the activity profiles. So rather than train on the videos, just train to predict the activity profiles. And that might be a way to get slightly more at what neurons would see. And that's an interesting question. I'll, I'll have to think more about that. Yeah, there's, there's no reason in principle we couldn't do that. Great. OK. Thank you very much, Blake. That was great. Thank you. Appreciate it. OK, so our next speaker um, is uh, Josh Siegel. Uh, Josh is a senior scientist at the Allen Institute. Uh, he joined the Institute in 2014. And his expertise is in um, extracellular electrophysiology and optogenetics experiments in vivo. And he's also heavily involved in the design and distribution of open source tools for electrophysiology. And the title of his talk is Building a Pipeline to Survey Spike and Activity Across the Mouse Visual System. Thank you, Josh. Welcome. Thanks a lot, Anton. Um, let me share my screen. OK, um, so yeah, my name is Josh. I'm a senior scientist at the Allen Institute. And today, I'm going to be talking about the electrophysiology portion of the Allen Brain Observatory, uh, which complements the two-photon image observatory, which you've heard about in many of the talks already today. Um, so the idea of a large-scale survey of in vivo cellular physiology is relatively new in neuroscience. Uh, but surveys are commonplace in other scientific domains, um, for example, in the field of astronomy. Uh, the cost of data acquisition hardware, in this case, a pair of 10 meter optical reflecting telescopes from the Keck Observatory in the Big Island of Hawaii. Um, the cost of this hardware far exceeds the budget of any individual researcher. And so scientists instead rely on centralized observatories like this one uh, to collect the data that they need for their work. Uh, such observatories typically operate in two different modes. Uh, they can either solicit proposals for where to point the telescope on a given night, and then give that data to the, the researchers who propose the experiment, uh, or they can conduct systematic surveys of large swaths of the sky. Um, in either case, um, conducting any sort of research requires tremendous collaboration between the people who design the studies, those who operate the telescopes, and those who analyze the data. Um, so at the Allen Institute, we have recently been employing an observatory model for studying the brains of awake behaving mice. Um, and in general, the field of rodent physiology is made up of many independent researchers that are carrying out boutique experiments. Um, and many of these rely on tools that are still being built by hand. Um, there's a lot of reinventing the wheel inside every lab. Um, and the advantage of this is that it allows for lots of creativity and flexibility in designing your own studies um, and kind of uh, adapting your experiments to the task at hand. Uh, but it also leads to low levels of reproducibility um, as well as, yeah, as, as I said, uh, like a, a lot of redundant development efforts where um, everyone is kind of building their own standards for, for doing experiments. Um, and then it, it becomes hard to replicate those studies by, uh, uh, hard for others to, to replicate those studies. Um, so I think that having access to a more centralized systematic mode of data collection could have huge benefits for the field. Uh, by generating reference data sets that are more comprehensive and less biased than those collected by individual investigators. And yeah, there's already been a lot of enthusiasm for this observatory model. Uh, as Joel said, it's a, a game changer for computational neuroscience. Um, and so yeah, today I will will talk to you about our efforts to expand this observatory model into the domain of electrophysiology. So Allen Institute has built two complementary pipelines uh, known as the Allen Brain Observatory. Um, that we use for large scale in vivo data collection. Um, so we have our, our two photon imaging pipeline, which you've heard about. And uh, now I'll tell you about the electrophysiology pipeline. 
Um, and each of these involve uh, a series of uh, highly standardized steps. And up until the point at which the data is collected, uh, these steps are more or less identical. So we start with our, our transgenic mice. Uh, in the imaging experiments, you need mice that express GCAMP in excitatory, uh, well, excitatory and, and inhibitory cells. Um, and for the electrophysiology experiments, we're using both wild type mice as well as mice that express channel rhodopsin in different interneuron subtypes um, so that we can um, stimulate them optogenetically and, and potentially identify these interneurons in our recordings. Um, surgical methods involves implanting a titanium head frame and removing a portion of the skull so we can access the brain. Um, in both cases, you implant a glass window over visual cortex, but in the EFIS experiments, we take that window off in order to insert the probes, whereas in image, the imaging experiments, you can image directly through the window. Um, in all cases, we do retinotopic mapping in order to um, in order to figure out where the different visual areas are so we can precisely target our electrodes or our microscope to them. Um, and then we get the mice habituated to head fixation and, and viewing this visual stimulus. Um, then at that point, the pipelines diverge. Um, you get the imaging experiments on one hand, and then um, we're using neuropixels probes to record from uh, both visual cortex as well as subcortical visual structures and, and hippocampus, um, all uh, recorded simultaneously in each experiment. Um, and then finally, um, we, uh, in the imaging experiments, use the tissue site two photon serial microscopy. And in um, neuropixels experiments, we use optical projection tomography to uh, figure out where our recordings were and to be able to register every neuron we record to the uh, mouse common coordinate framework from the Allen Institute. So the silicon probes that we're using uh, are called neuropixels. These were developed by IMEC in collaboration with scientists at the Allen Institute, University College London, and uh, HHMI Genealogy Research Campus. Uh, these probes are really fantastic. Uh, they make it possible to record spiking activity for more neurons than was previously possible, um, thanks to their high site density, as well as their long shank length. Um, so yeah, thanks to neuropixels, we can now routinely measure action potentials from thousands of neurons in a single mouse brain. Uh, a number that will continue to grow in the coming years. So in each experiment, uh, we insert six probes into the visual cortex of mice, um, guided by this map that we obtained through intrinsic signal imaging. Um, so uh, the cartoon on the left shows the, the general schematic uh, that we're shooting for in each experiment, where we, we stick uh, one probe in e to each of these, these six visual areas, uh, V1, LM, AL, RL, AM, and PM. Um, and then because the probes are so long, uh, we can insert them down deep into the brain and record simultaneously from subcortical visual areas, um, including LGN and LP. And so this uh, gives us the opportunity to do a really like um, large scale survey of the mouse central, central visual, visual system um, and record many more cells than was previously possible. Uh, on the right, you see an overview of um, the locations of, of all the cells that we record from these areas after they've been registered to the common coordinate framework. So this is kind of a, a view from the, the front of the brain to the back of the brain, uh, looking through uh, visual cortex on the top, uh, and then the hippocampus, uh, CA1 and dentate gyrus in, in the middle, um, and then the green and the pink represent LP and LG and the thalamus. So this is over, over 60,000 cells that we've uh, recorded spike trains from in response to visual stimuli and then have registered to uh, the, the common coordinate framework. So uh, this is what a typical recording looks like. Um, you can see here a spike raster from eight different visual areas. Um, and the, here the stimulus is a, a drifting grating shown at, at different temporal frequencies. Um, and, and some of the areas like V1 and LGN, you can see that these uh, neurons are, are locking their activity to the, the frequency of, of these gratings. Um, in tandem with all of the spike train data, we're also recording local field potentials from every electrode. Um, the example line labeled HPC shows the theta rhythm from one channel in, in hippocampus, um, but we have over a thousand channels of, of local field potential data that we're, we're collecting simultaneously. Uh, we're also looking at the mouse's behavioral activity, um, monitoring its, its run speed as it runs on a disc, um, and as well as its pupil width, and we have mul multiple cameras that are, are, are trained on the, on the mouse. 
So um, yeah, this is all done in the context of passive visual stimulation. Um, and the, the stimulus set that the, we're using is, is based on the one used for the two photon imaging experiments. Um, so you can see on the, the top row is the, um, well, the, the very top are the examples of the different visual stimuli that we use. And then the row below that is the time course of the stimuli for the electrophysiology experiments. And um, you can see that chunks of those stimuli are, are taken directly from the three sessions used in the two photon imaging observatory. Um, so that allows us to do uh, a really nice head to head comparison of the EFIS and the imaging data, which is something that, that Saskia will, will talk about later. Um, so yeah, we have diverse visual stimuli. We wanted to show uh, a nice mix of artificial and, and natural stimuli. So we can um, do this high throughput characterization of the visual response properties of all these all these different areas. Um, this is an example of the response of uh, a single cell to drifting grading stimulus. So the stimulus is varying in, in temporal frequency uh, along the vertical axis and, and direction along the horizontal axis. And um, each little portion of this, this grid on the left represents the raster of activity in response to 15 presentations of, of uh, the drifting grading stimulus with the same conditions. And so, yeah, you can see very clearly um, the direction that this, um, that this cell prefers, um, as well as its uh, preferred frequency. Um, it tends to, to fire more to, to lower temporal frequencies. Um, and then on the right is a, a summary plot that, um, yeah, takes the, the activity of, of each of these trials and um, shows it in a very um, succinct way what the what the neurons preferred direction and, and temporal frequency are. And uh, interestingly, this um, neuron actually changes its preferred direction at, at higher temporal frequencies, um, which is, is something that has been observed previously. So the every experiment also includes a receptive field mapping stimulus. Um, this is super important because um, not only do we want to know which area we're recording from, but we want to know which region of visual space these cells that we are recording from are tuned to. Um, and so to do this, we show a grading stimulus that's 20 degrees wide, uh, randomly at 81 different locations on the screen. Um, and so the response to a location in the center of the screen is shown in the, the spike raster here. So you can see this neuron has uh, a very, um, a very reliable response to presentation in the in the middle of the screen. Um, if we collapse that over these 45 presentations, um, we get the peristimulus time histogram or, or PSDH at each of these locations. And then we, if we collapse that even further and basically just count the total number of spikes that occur when the stimulus is on the screen at a particular location, uh, then we can get this heat map that shows the, the um, preferred location of the, uh, for this cell. So we can do this in parallel for all the cells that we record, and then we can aggregate across experiments. Um, and so this plot shows a, a summary of the uh, preferred elevation for um, tens of thousands of cells that, that we've recorded in, in Cortex. Um, and you can see this, this smoothly varying map of, of elevation uh, across areas. Um, each area has more or less complete representation of the uh, entire visual field. And um, so then the, that's why you can see that these, these smoothly varying gradients of elevation. Uh, you can also see this in the subcortical areas that we record, LGN and LP, um, which validates both the receptive field mapping uh, procedure that we're using as well as our, um, as well as our method of, of registering the cells anatomically to the common coordinate framework. Uh, so one of the key questions we're trying to answer with this data set is basically how all these visual areas are, are functionally organized um, and uh, ultimately how they all interact in order to, to guide behavior. Um, for example, do they process information more or less independently um, or are they passing signals to one another in a hierarchical manner? Um, and so to address this, this question of hierarchical processing, uh, we leverage the, the data from this, the, this large scale survey. Um, the concept of hierarchical processing is, of course, central to neuroscience. 
Uh, it's one of the guiding principles for understanding how the brain can flexibly switch between a variety of specialized tasks. Um, this diagram shows the hierarchical organization of the macaque visual system, uh, which has been very well characterized. Um, we have simple uh, receptive fields in the retina and LGN. Um, these are used to by the cortex to generate increasingly complex representations of the visual world. And when you get all the way up to IT cortex on the right, um, it's common to find neurons that respond to specific faces and objects and, and other um, complex stimuli. So uh, the degree to which similar hierarchical processing occurs in the mouse cortex uh, has not been well characterized. So this is um, something that we wanted to address with our large data set. So uh, we do have some understanding of, of the organization of these areas based on anatomical data. Um, so another survey from the Allen Institute, the Allen Mouse Connectivity Atlas, uh, used viral injections to trace the connections between almost every combination of areas in the mouse brain. Um, and a team at the Institute used this data to establish the anatomical hierarchy for the mouse cortex and thalamus. Um, all the areas they looked at are shown in their relative hierarchical order uh, in the plot on the left. Um, and when we zoom in on just the areas that we recorded in our EFIS survey, um, you can see that there's a, a clear hierarchical progression uh, beginning with LGN and thalamus and up to AM in, in the cortex sitting at the top. And so we sought to uh, use the spiking data that we collected uh, to determine whether we could find evidence for a functional hierarchy that mirrors the one that was found anatomically. And so to do this, we employed a general approach that had been used previously to study hierarchical relationships in groups of pigeons. Um, when a flock of birds is flying together, uh, sometimes uh, certain birds will initiate turns and others will follow them. Um, it's not completely random when, when uh, they decide to turn. Um, and if you look at the pairwise interactions between all, all the different birds in the flock and basically look um, who tends to initiate turns and who tends to follow the leaders, uh, these sort of leader follow, follower relationships, which are, are pairwise relationships, um, you can use that information to establish the overall hierarchy uh, across the entire flock. Um, and so we use this general approach to study the mouse brain. Um, and what we did is basically look at during periods of strong visual stimulation, uh, which do neurons in, in one area tend to lead neurons in another area and, and do some neurons tend to follow. Uh, and we do this by looking at the time lags and the cross correlogram, uh, which is a standard method for looking at uh, interactions between cells. And what we find is that the, the structure, uh, the hierarchical structure um, derived from this um, looking at leader follower relationships between pairs of neurons, uh, which is completely independent of the, of the anatomy. So we didn't have any assumptions about the anatomy baked into this. Uh, you see a structure that uh, really nicely matches what is seen uh, anatomically. So the plot on the far left is the, um, the difference between the anatomical hierarchy score um, derived from these, um, drive from the viral tracer injection experiments. And then the um, middle plot is what we see when we look at the relative time lags between cells in, in different areas. And you can see that the, the structure looks very similar. Um, and then when you look at the uh, correlation between cells in the, uh, sorry, the correlation between the anatomical hierarchy score difference and the median CCG time lag difference, uh, for each of these area pairs, uh, you see that they are, are strongly correlated. So this, this validates that this, this anatomical hierarchy um, is replicated in a, a similar functional hierarchy. Um, so in, in, in addition to this, uh, we looked at whether we could see um, classical metrics of hierarchy that, that varied um, across the different areas of the mouse visual system. So one of these is the size of the receptive field so traditionally, it's thought that as you go from uh, lower visual areas to higher visual areas, the size of the receptive field will increase and the cells will integrate over a larger, larger portion of visual space. Um, and this is exactly what we see. Um, LGN has the smallest receptive fields and AM has the largest receptive fields. Um, but I think what, what surprised us is that uh, in the plot on the right, there's a really, really strong correlation between this anatomical hierarchy score and the average receptive field size. Um, uh, 
R value of, of 0.97, which is ridiculously high. Um, and so it seems like we're able to predict uh, functional features of the network just based on the anatomical information. Um, and we see something similar for the time to first spike, which is basically the, like as soon as the stimulus is flashed, uh, how long does it take for the first spikes to show up in, the, in each area? Um, and again, we see very strong correlation of um, between this anatomical hierarchy score and the time to first spike. Um, but ultimately, what we want to understand is how these, um, yeah, how how the hierarchical relationships between these areas allows the mouse to perform visually guided behavior. And so, as a first step in this direction, um, we trained mice to do a, a behavioral task where they they view a flash stimulus um, and at random times, the, the stimulus will change from uh, one natural image to another natural image. And as soon as the stimulus changes, the, the mouse has to lick uh, a spout in order to get water reward. Um, so the mouse becomes really good at being able to detect these changes. And um, then we can look at the neural activity and see um, how the activity differs when the it's a repeated stimulus versus a, a change stimulus. Um, and so here on the right, you see three examples uh, from LGN, V1, and AM. Um, and the raster is on the top, and the, the PSH is on the bottom. And you can see that in all cases, the response to the change flash, uh, which is uh, represented by the darker line, uh, is larger than the response to the, the pre-change flash. Um, however, this the the difference between these um, between these responses increases up the hierarchy. So um, the, the difference is is rather small in LGN, it becomes larger in V1, and is, is the largest in, in AM. And um, so this is suggesting that um, the response to the change could be amplified uh, as you, you move along the hierarchy. Um, but one thing that we wanted to do to confirm that this is actually being used by the mouse or had, had the potential to be um, guiding the mouse's behavior um, is to kind of use a, um, a decoder to um, look at the response to the change flash in each area and, um, and determine independent of what the mouse does, whether or not um, there was a change. Um, and so in each of these, you can look at each of these areas independently and um, use the neural activity to um, decide the, the probability that there was a change or there was not a change. Um, and then look what the mouse actually did on that trial. Um, and when you do this, you see that the there's a, a strong correlation between the um, a, a correlation between the correlation of the decoder prediction and the mouse's behavior. So um, the the decoder uh, is less correlated with mouse's behavior in LGN um, and more correlated in AM and, and PM and, and these these higher areas. So um, this provides um this the start of a, a emerging picture that this this uh hierarchical organization uh is actually useful for performing this behavioral task so um there's a lot of of analysis that we've done that i didn't have time to go into today uh we have a, a preprint on uh all this work that's on on bioarchive so i encourage you to to check that out um but i also encourage you to uh take a look at the the data itself so um, all the data that I talked about is available publicly through the, the Allen SDK. Um, this is a, a Python library, and once you install it, then it's it's really easy to download the the data that um, the download the neural data without borders files that contain the spiking data and the, the LFP data, um, as well as behavioral information like running speed and and pupil diameter. Um, and so so far for the uh, NeuroPixels data set, we've released 58 sessions uh, featuring the diverse visual stimuli that I told you about, um, total of 99,000 units from uh, Cortex, Hippocampus, Thalamus, and Midbrain. Um, and um, yeah, for, for more details about this, you can check out uh, portal.brainmap.org um, or go to the uh, Allen SDK read the, read the docs page. And um, if you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to ask them on the Allen Brain Map Community Forum. This is a, a great resource for uh, getting help with any of the Allen Institute tools. 
So um, I'd like to thank everyone who was involved in uh, designing and, and carrying out these experiments. Um, it was like a genuine team, team effort. There were over 80 people on the, the bioarchive preprint, which uh, represents everybody who, who made a, uh, a key contribution to generating or analyzing this data. Um, and of course, also have to thank Paul Allen uh, for his vision, encouragement, and support. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, Josh. Uh, excellent talk. All right, um, do we have questions? Please write them in the ask a question window. And um, we do have a few minutes left. So um, I, I have a question, Josh. Um, can you tell us about um, the future of the EFIS pipeline and the Brain Observatory? What's next? What's coming? Yeah, so um, currently we are gearing up to run these behavioral experiments at a, a much larger scale. Um, the, the data that went into the preprint is was basically pilot experiments, um, but now we are running those experiments in, in pipeline mode. Um, and so we'll, we'll get a uh, much more complete data set of um, what is going on in, in the mouse brain during this change detection task. Um, and then after that, the plan is to expand beyond the visual cortex and, and uh, thalamic visual areas and see what's going on across the entire brain um, and do multi neural pixels recordings um, all the way from the cerebellum to prefrontal cortex and um, yeah just expand beyond our limited set of areas that we've recorded so far great thanks exciting times mm -hmm. um, also um, i'm curious so these neural pixels probes are very powerful and they uh, provide uh, activity of a lot of neurons and recordings. Um, so how how far are we, do you think, from a technological limit uh, with electrophysiological recordings? How, how much better it can become with like a single probe? Yeah, I mean, so one thing that we're testing right now is basically how much you gain by having higher density of sites on the, on the probe. So um, right now, the the sites are 20 microns apart vertically, um, but we're currently testing probes that have five micron spacing between, um, five or six micron spacing between the sites. And so that will tell us like how much density buys you in terms of being able to improve your spike sorting methods and identify different cell types through their uh, electrophysiological waveforms. Um, another, um, big push is to reduce the overall size of the probes. So um, the the shank itself will, will stay the same length, but then basically the additional hardware that you need to acquire the data, um, that can be shrunk down a lot. And so as that gets smaller and smaller, you can stick more probes into the brain simultaneously. So I think we're really just at the inflection point really where uh, things are really gonna start to take off and um, we'll soon be inserting more and more probes into the brain at once. Yeah, great. All right. Thank you, Josh. That was wonderful. Yep. And we'll move to the next speaker now. So um, to wrap up the session and the whole workshop, um, we will have the talk by Saskia De Vries. Hi, Saskia. Hi. So Saskia is an assistant investigator at the Allen Institute. Um, her expertise is in systems neuroscience studies in both vertebrate and invertebrate systems uh, using a combination of physiological, computational, behavioral, and molecular tools. And today she will tell us, uh, she will be telling us about uh, reconciling functional differences in neural populations inferred from two photon imaging and electrophysiology. Welcome, Saskia. Thank you. Let me get this shared. And all right, so I assume you can see the presentation. Um, yes, that's great. great. Thanks. So thanks, Anton, um, and thanks to CNS for allowing us to have this workshop. Um, I think this has been 
a really fun couple of days learning about um, all these different data sets that um, it, there's been a lot of years when we've been developing them. And now that they're kind of all out there in the world, it's, it's really fun to, to see them and see what people are doing with them. So I'm going to be um, talking about um, some work that we've done recently um, comparing these two data sets that we've been talking about today, the two photon imaging data set and the high density electrophysiology data set that Josh just told you about. Um, and this work I've been doing uh, with a team, but primarily Josh Siegel and Peter Lehowicz have been um, kind of leading this effort of um, using the, the, these two large data sets we have um, in order to compare them so we can start to think about um, the differences in these modalities and, and what they reveal about the underlying activity of the, of the neural populations. So as you've heard a lot today about these two different data sets, um, one using calcium imaging, the other using um, electrophysiology, um, and we've designed these pipelines in which we collect the data so that they are as, as, as identical as possible. Um, so these early steps in terms of um, breeding the mice, doing the surgeries, the retinotopic mapping, these are pretty much the exact same um, steps. Um, it's really only when we get to the, the recording where the, they deviate in one case so we can do the calcium imaging, in the other case to use the electrophysiology. Um, but even there, we've gone to great lengths to um, engineer the hardware so that we maintain um, the exact same configuration in our rigs so that the viewing angle of the monitor, the distance of the monitor, um, the running device that the mouse is, is um, head fixed on, um, all of that is, 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 is exactly the same. And so using these two complementary data sets, uh, these two complementary pipelines, we've created two complementary data sets um, before I get there, I just want to introduce some nomenclature. Um, I'm going to be that I'm going to use, um, and we use this a lot, uh, where we call electrophysiology EFIS. Most of the world does, um, but we also use the the, the abbreviation of OFIS um, to talk about the calcium imaging, the optical physiology. Um, so I just want to introduce that because I don't think that's quite as common. Um, so so people won't get confused as I do that. Um, all right, so we've collected these two complementary data sets. Um, Josh has um, just shown you this, this figure at the top that shows all of the different stimuli that we used. And you can see how the different sessions from the calcium imaging were embedded into the single session that was used for the electrophysiology. And so we have the exact same stimulus. Um, and we're going to use the responses to these stimuli um, across these two data sets to compare their responses. The bottom, what we're showing is the, the yield that we have. Um, we're restricting our analysis in this case to um, five of the visual areas um, and only to the excitatory or the regular spiking units in EFIS um, and the, um, the data collected from the excitatory CRE lines um, in, the, in the OFIS data. Um, and so you can see the yield here um, below. Um, it's, it's not quite evenly distributed across the areas and layers um, because of the creed lines that we choose in, in, the, in the calcium imaging. Um, and so we have done, um, and I'm, I'm not actually gonna show this in great detail, but we have kind of resampled the data to match the layer distributions across areas um, between the two data sets, um, which um, uh, we don't see any differences when we include all of the data as it is, um, but uh, we, we do do that to kind of account for that. So these are two different um, it, recording modalities, right? Calcium imaging uses calcium indicators, and what we're looking at is the the, the influx of calcium into cells when cells are firing spikes, whereas um, electrophysiology is recording these extracellular spikes. Um, and so I think it's pretty well known that they have very different spatial and temporal resolutions. So on the left, I'm showing a heat map of the neural activity um, with calcium imaging on the top, about 50, neuro, about couple, maybe 100 neurons in this plot, and a raster plot from the EFIS, um, the same number of neurons, and you can see kind of different patterns of activity. And we can zoom in, and at, you know, at this scale, we're at one time point in our in the resolution of our calcium imaging that's imaged at 30 hertz. Um, but you can see lots of, of, of fluctuations and spikes in these neurons. And so we have a much better temporal resolution with the electrophysiology where we can actually get precise spike times um, for, for, for individual neurons. Um, but at the same time, the spatial resolution is a little bit different. Um, as Josh mentioned, the, the sites on the probes are about 20 microns apart. And so how well we can um, uh, 
locate where each neuron is within um, it, within the, the cortical tissue is a little um, less precise with the electrophysiology as it is with the two photon imaging, um, where we, we have better spatial resolution. Um, but these are also orthogonal mo mo modalities as we're showing here. The calcium imaging, we image across a single plane um, and the data set that we've collected here, we're just doing single plane imaging. There's no volume to it. And so we only have data in a single plane um, across about a 400 micron square um, field of view. While the um, electrodes, the neuropixel probes um, penetrate through the layers, um, orthogonally through the layers. And so these are two different axes where we're, in one case, we're imaging a lot of neurons in a single layer. And in the other case, we're imaging across all of the layers, but only a few neurons for each at each depth. Um, but these are, you know, two modalities that are used widely in our field. Um, and because they have different advantages, one, some of the advantages that I've just kind of outlined here in terms of spatial and temporal resolution, but also, you know, you can think of the ways that, um, for instance, calcium imaging can be um, used to target specific genetic populations pretty easily, either using Cree lines, or we can target um, particular populations based off of their projection patterns using um, anterior or retrograde viral strategies. Um, also, yesterday in Nuno's talk, he was showing a lot of EM data, and there's been a couple of studies where we've been able to combine calcium imaging, um, in vivo calcium imaging with an ex vivo EM, um, and we have enough structural information that we can align those two data sets and we can look at the connectivity of neurons that we have, the physiological responses. And so there's reasons to use both of these modalities in our ongoing research. Um, and so I think it's really important that we kind of better understand how the recordings that we get from each of these modalities is really representing the underlying activity so that we can better relate those to the data that we collect with each of them to each other. So um, in doing this comparison, we've got our, our OFIS data um, and our EFIS data. Um, and what we've done is we're taking the spike times from the EFIS data and we're extracting events um, from the calcium traces from the delta F over F. We use an L0 regularized algorithm, um, and this identifies the onset time and the magnitude of change in fluorescence. Um, and I think it's important to, to, to note right now that these events don't necessarily represent individual spikes. Um, and they're, they're somewhat biased towards um, little bursts of spikes, little bouts of high instantaneous firing rates. Um, but we use the events in this case, the spike times for the EFIS, and then we use us, we then pass this into the same um, analysis where we look at the responses to our different stimuli, computing various metrics and, 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 and tuning properties. So um, briefly to, to just kind of overview what we're finding that I'll kind of go through in, in a little bit more detail, um, we compute, we're comparing kind of three different types of metrics. The first is looking at responsiveness, um, how many neurons respond to, uh, to the different stimuli. And what we find overall is that the EFIS data, we see that, the, that more neurons are responsive to the stimuli that we've shown in our data sets. We look at, uh, we also compute selectivity metrics. Um, these are things like orientation selectivity, direction selectivity, lifetime sparseness. And actually the one that I'm gonna be using in this talk is, is lifetime sparseness. Um, which gives a measure of kind of how selectively the cell responds to um, the different conditions of a stimulus. So in, the, in our grading stimuli, we show gratings that move in different directions and different temporal frequencies. Does it respond really broadly at all directions um, or is it very specific to a single direction or an orientation? Um, and what we find generally here is that the OFIS data, um, the, the responsive neurons in OFIS are more selective than the EFIS, quite remarkably so. And then the last type of metric we look at is a preference metric, which is basically just looking at the tuning, so the preferred spatial or the preferred temporal frequency of those conditions. And here we don't see very big differences between the modalities. Um, they look very similar. So just to show this um, graphically, um, here I'm comparing responsiveness um, for, the, for the four stimuli that we use, the two different grading stimuli, the natural scenes and the natural movies. The green shows the, the fraction of responsive neurons in the OFIS data set and the gray shows the same for the EFIS data set. And you can see for all of these different stimuli across all of the areas, this is consistently higher um, for the EFIS data set.
The numbers up above here um, is a metric called the Jensen-Shannon distance, uh, which quantifies the disparity between the distributions. Um, and the distributions actually, this, this, these bar plots show you the, the percent of cells that are above a, um, a responsiveness of 0.25, which is the fraction of trials of the cell's preferred condition that we see a significant response on. Um, but when we compute the metric, we look at that distribution of how many trials for, for all of the neurons in each population um, does it respond to. So um, that, that distribution kind of is, is broader, but in the, the fraction we show here is just how many are above 0.25. Um, and this metric, um, if the distributions perfectly overlap, the metric will be zero. When they're completely non-overlapping, it will be one. Um, and so it gives us a, a way to quantify how, how different the distributions are. Looking at preference, as I mentioned before here, we see pretty nice alignment between the two modalities. And again, the same metric um, now we see is very low, very close to zero, indicating that there's not much of a difference between um, the OFIS and the EFIS data sets here. But when we look at the selectivity, the lifetime sparseness, um, here we see very big um, differences in our distributions where um, the OFIS has very high lifetime sparseness, while the EFIS actually has pretty low lifetime sparseness, and we see a big disparity between them. So we want to understand better these differences um, and what might be causing them. Um, and one thing that we can consider is that when we do our calcium imaging, we're using transgenic mice that um, have been bred to, to express um, our calcium indicator, GCAMP6, um, in specific populations of neurons. Um, and so one question we have is whether that expression of GCAMP or of CRE, um, of the different components that are used to express that calcium indicator, could be um, altering the underlying physiology. And so we took our GCAMP mice that we could be using for calcium imaging, but instead of imaging them um, under a microscope, we recorded them with our neural pixel probes. Um, and so we took four different lines um, that I'm showing here. Um, two of them are, um, have GCAMP expressed densely in the excitatory populations in the SLC17 and CUX2. And then two of the lines um, have GCAMP expressed in um, inhibitory neurons. So it's a more sparse expression pattern, uh, but in a different population of neurons. Um, but then we're recording with the neuropixels. I think it's kind of important to point out, we're not just recording from the, the neurons that are expressing GCAMP. We're recording from all of the units that the, the, that the probe can, can pick up on. Um, but what we're asking is whether the expression of GCAMP in these different populations might alter the underlying physiology of um, in the, these the cortical areas. So here just shows um, a summary of the unit count. The black bar is our wild type mice. And then these different colored bars correspond to the different um, Cree lines that we used here. Um, so we've recorded data from a number of mice for each of these. Um, and first we just compare kind of overall activity. So the firing rate, um, this is the distribution of firing rate on, on the top across the five different areas. And again, with this, um, the distance, this disparity metric, uh, we see they're pretty similar um, in comparison with a wild type. So our overall firing rate looks pretty much the same. Um, we then um, computed the burst fraction using um, a method where we can identify spikes that um, are within a burst where there's short um, interspike intervals between a, a group of spikes. Um, and we're computing what fraction of neuron uh, of spikes for a given neuron um, are within bursts. And so that's what this distribution is here. And here we do see a little bit of a difference, um, a pretty subtle difference, and primarily for these, these two um, lines that have the dense expression um, in the excitatory populations. But it's not a very big difference, um, but we do see a subtle difference there. So could, you know, we don't see big differences in firing rate. We see some subtle differences in the bursting activity. Could this maybe be resulting in um, different responses in terms of our, our, our selectivities or our responsiveness that we saw between the, the EFIS and the OFIS data set? Could this actually just be underlying physiology? Um, and it does, it does, does not appear to be the case. So here we're showing um, the percent of responsive neurons. Again, the black bar is our, our wild type with neuropixels, and then these are um, these uh, these Cree lines. And in fact, here what we see is actually, if, if anything, it's a slightly higher responsive rate in these transgenic mice rather than lower, which is what we saw with the OFIS data set. Um, but the differences are pretty small, um, and so it's probably not huge, but we do see that it's um, it, it's not we're not seeing what we saw with the OFIS. And when we look at the lifetime sparseness distribution, again, we see a, this pretty typical distribution for, for EFIS where the lifetime sparseness is skewed towards 
towards low values of this metric. And so from this, we conclude that um, there might be some subtle differences in the physiology, but these aren't the type, these differences don't result in the, the big differences that we see between the OFIS and the EFIS metrics that we've, we've computed. Um, so given these, uh, these differences, one of the, one of the things we wanted to try is if we could convert, um, we can transform the spike trains that we record with the EFIS into simulated um, calcium imaging, um, could that reconcile some of the differences that we see in our response metrics? And to do this, we used a forward model um, that is, does a spikes to calcium transformation. We used a ML spike, which is a biophysically inspired forward model. Um, that considers the cooperative binding between GCAMP and the calcium to generate this synthetic um, fluorescence traces, delta F over F fluorescence traces. And then we could take those fluorescence traces, extract the events using our L0 regularized detection algorithm, um, and then again, pass it into the same analysis that we, we use uh, for all of this. So this, um, just a little bit of information about this forward model. As I mentioned before, we're using this ML spike algorithm. There's a number of parameters that go into this. And some of these parameters we fit from some um, simultaneous Inuvo patch plus um, calcium imaging recordings that we have. Um, and there's a couple of preprints that describe um, the, that data set. Um, and so some of these metrics were calibrated from that. And then three of the metrics we, um, we fit uh, to the, the distributions of, of, of what we see in, in our calcium data. Um, and so this is, these are the amplitudes, the decay time, and the, the noise level. Um, and these are showing the distribution of these parameters in our entire data set. Um, and in what I'm, the data I'm going to show you, we um, use the four model with these maximum likelihood values. So the mode of these distributions were used to parameterize this four model. Uh, I'm not going to, because of time, I'm not going to go into it, but we have kind of looked at this across a range of, of values for these, for each of these three um, parameters. Um, and what we find is that the, these um, maximum likelihood ones really give us kind of the best, um, the kind of the closest match between the, the two modalities. So um, what we can see is that, so this just kind of demonstrates here we have our original spike train, the forward model turns it into this simulated delta F over F, and then we can extract the events the, the way that we do for our, our calcium, for our actual experimental calcium data. And so you can see the event, um, the event uh, traces that, that kind of yield from a given spike train here. Um, here I'm showing an example of a cell where we've, we're looking at its responses to the drifting gratings. And there's you know, 15 trials for each grading condition. And um, you can see kind of the raster plot here. Um, and uh, this is the, kind of the equivalent raster plot for the event magnitudes after, for the same cell after it's been passed through the forward model. And so we see you know, which condition it prefers seems pretty consistent. The trials that have big responses um, in the EFIS uh, with kind of these dense bursts, we see these big um, clusters of, of, of events. But one thing that's kind of important to note here is on this, this plot on the right is showing um, kind of the, the, the sum to magnitude for each trial, right? So it's a two second trial. We add all the spikes together um, and that gives us the, the response per, per trial. Um, and we do the same thing for um, after the forward model where we um, add all of the event magnitudes together. And one of the things that you can see about what's happening is that um, once we've kind of turned the activity into this simulated delta F over F, these, um, the places where we see um, kind of these large kind of bursts sequences um, really kind of get amplified. The, the shorter interspike intervals kind of create a larger, yield a larger event magnitude. And so those somewhat get a bit amplified while um, trials where there's a few spikes, but not in a, not close together, um, those spikes get added together linearly with the EFIS, but the event magnitudes are much lower. Um, and so that it yields a, a kind of a more, a sparser response for the OFIS, for the, the stimulated OFIS than for the original ethers. And, um, and I'll, I'll come back to this because we think this is what is causing this difference in our selectivity metric. So when we compare the, um, the metrics after we've passed our EFIS data uh, through this forward model, um, so now I'm comparing um, we're, what we're looking at now is the responsiveness. Um, in green, again, is our original OFIS, and in yellow is the EFIS after it's been passed through our forward model. 
And we actually continue to see this increase in responsiveness for our EFIS data, even after we've turned it into simulated um, calcium traces. And what we're showing on the left is the number of units that were responsive in the EFIS before the forward model and after the forward model. And we see that there's 8% of these units actually switch from being responsive to not responsive or vice versa, but in equal proportion. And so while some cells that were responsive in the original data become uh, unresponsive after the forward model, there's an equal number of cells that have the opposite um, transformation. And so at the end of the day, we see that, that there's still this elevated responsiveness in our EFIS data compared to the calcium imaging. Looking at preference, we don't see a big difference. And again, we didn't see a difference between the two modalities in our preference metric, the preferred temporal frequency here. Um, again, a few, there are about 12% of the units do change which temporal frequency they prefer, but in kind of equal, again, equal numbers kind of going in and going out. And so that underlying distribution um, stays, stays the same. But with the selectivity, we actually see that passing the EFIS data through the forward model, we do see that it increases um, the lifetime sparseness metric for most of the neurons. And you see this cloud of data pretty much all falls above of, uh, unity in this plot. And this distribution becomes a lot closer to the OFIS distribution that we saw, but it's still not, uh, still not the same. Um, but it's definitely um, remarkably closer. And so, um, as I mentioned before, this sparsifying of the responses um, is probably what's contributing to this, this shift of the, this selectivity distribution. So um, given that the, the forward model can um, kind of account for some of the discrepancies between the two, but not quite all of them, we then started to consider whether there might be um, some, some kind of biases in um, the, the recording modalities. Um, and there's some well-known selection biases um, in, for instance, in electrophysiology, um, where uh, we know that electrophysiology is more likely to record from larger units that have um, more spikes. Um, and part of this comes from the recording and part of this also comes from um, the spike sorting where you need to have a sufficient number of spikes in order to be able to do that spike sorting for an individual unit. Um, and so one of the things that we looked at is whether, considered whether the EFIS might be, be kind of selectively recording um, cells that have really high firing rates. Um, in, in OFIS, on the other hand, when you're imaging a field of view, as long as you can see that the cells, we can identify them and extract their fluorescence traces and, and analyze them. And so a cell just has to be just active enough that we can find it um, and, and have that trace. And so the, the OFIS might be picking up more cells that have very low activities um, compared to the EFIS. So what we did is we, um, Subselected uh, data from the, the OFIS data set. So we subselected neurons based off of their event rate. Um, so you can see kind of below, this is a distribution of the OFIS event rate. Um, and when we're including all of the, uh, in this, these comparisons that I'll unpack in a moment, 100% we're including all of the cells. And then we raise the threshold on the event rate and only include cells that have an event rate above a certain threshold. So at 80%, oops clicked accidentally, um, at 80%, our event threat rate threshold is, is here, whereas for 20%, you can see it's up here at what point, point 0.2. Um, and what we're plotting here on the top is um, the, the median lifetime sparseness of the distribution. Each line is one of the, the visual areas. On the right is the fraction of responsive neurons. And you can see that both the, the lifetime sparseness and the fraction of responsive neurons increases as we restrict the neurons that we, were, we include to the, most, um, to the most active ones. Below, we're showing this Jensen-Shannon distance that, that measures the disparity between the distributions. Um, and you can see as we get more and more um, restrictive in terms of which neurons we're including, while the lifetime sparseness actually deviates further away from the EFIS distribution, the responsiveness actually gets um, closer. And so between when we're including only 20 to 40% of the OFIS units, um, that's where we see the, kind of the best alignment of um, the fraction of responsive neurons between OFIS and EFIS. So this suggests that the EFIS um, the reason we have this high responsiveness in EFIS is because it's selectively recording um, the, the, the most active cells um, that then are also responsive. Um, 
We can do a similar analysis where we subselect EFIS units. Um, and in this case, we're subselecting them based off of one of the QC metrics that we use, which is the ISI violation. So this is a metric which quantifies the fraction of spikes violate the ISI window, um, and thus um, might are likely to be from a different unit. And so there's a, 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 some amount of contamination coming from other units. And so here now what we're doing is we're, we're essentially lowering the threshold on this ISI violation, um, where when we have a high threshold, we're including more units that might have more contamination. We get, uh, as we lower that, that threshold, we have um, cleaner and cleaner um, units. Um, I should point out that even with an ISI violation of zero, it's possible that there's contamination from other units. Um, there's still contamination, just contamination that doesn't violate that ISI window. And so again, looking at the median values for lifetime sparseness and for the fraction responsive, um, and then looking at the, the distance metric, we see that these distance metrics really are lowest when we're the most restrictive and only including the, the least contaminated units in our data set. Um, this 20% is really when we basically have ISI violations of zero, where there's, there's no ISI violations um, in these neurons. And we see that for both the lifetime sparseness and the, um, the percent of, of responsive uh, neurons, that, that we see that, that closest alignment of those distributions when we um, really select the most, um, the, the, sorry, the least contaminated units. So this, I'm just gonna, this summarizes this same analysis that we've done. All of the, the plots that I've shown you have been restricted to the drifting grading stimulus, um, but we've done this across the other stimuli as well, comparing the responsiveness, preference, and selectivity metrics. Um, and what this plot summarizes is this distance metric between the OFIS and the EFIS. This gray, the, the values here in, on, that are shaded in gray are with the original EFIS, and in yellow is after um, the EFIS after we pass it through the forward model. And then you can see just that we've got the baseline comparison, a comparison when we match the layer distributions, um, when we match, um, I, I didn't discuss this, but the, the animals running behavior um, so that we can um, select experiments when the mice are running kind of a comparable amount between the two data sets because we know that running can influence um, activity, whether that might be um, affecting these differences. But then when we also do this subselecting for events, uh, but the event rate in the OFIS or subselecting um, EFIS units based on the, on the interspike interval violations. Um, and we see kind of consistently across these data sets that kind of after the forward model, um, when we use this subselecting based off of events and ISI, that's where we get the best alignment um, between the, the two modalities. So finally, um, uh, we can think a little bit um, beyond just kind of these, these metrics of, of, of responses and think about some of these functional properties. Um, in Michael's talk earlier this morning, um, he showed a figure very similar to this one down here where he'd done a functional classification of neurons um, based off of their joint reliabilities to the different stimuli that we show. Um, and he pointed out that there is a large fraction of neurons that don't have reliable responses to any of our stimuli. And then we see these different patterns of neurons that respond, say, to both reliably, both to the drifting gratings in natural movies or to all four of our stimuli um, over here in this green bar and, and various combinations. And when we do the same analysis um, with the EFIS data, um, we get a very different distribution where now the majority of our neurons uh, I guess not majority, the plurality of our neurons fall into this, uh, this green category where they have reliable responses to all of the stimuli. Um, and there's none of the units are in this, this none category. One of the things that's part of this functional classification classification is that we have this threshold that we put on um, the, the reliabilities of the responses, which is the, again, the fraction of, of trials that we see a significant response. Um, and as we've seen in what I've shown you already, um, we, the, the EFIS cells have higher responsiveness across, across the board to all of the different stimuli that we show. And so as we um, increase the, this threshold in our clustering analysis um, for the EFIS data set, and then here again, we're looking at the distance between this distribution and the OFIS distribution. Um, as we raise that threshold for EFIS, we see that the distributions become closer and closer. And so this plot down here is at um, when the EFIS has a threshold of 40, we actually see a very similar distribution now to what we see with the OFIS. Um, and so when we account for the differences in these modalities and the selection biases in which the EFIS is, is systematically recording from kind of higher um, neurons that have higher activity, um, 
and missing these kind of low firing rate units, um, that when we account for those differences, we do in fact see very similar properties of, of the responses of these underlying populations. So with this, I will um, wrap up. Uh, these two modalities offer distinct views of the underlying activity, and they have some systematic differences and systematic biases um, in, in their recordings. But when we account for these biases in our analyses, um, we can reconcile the, the differences between these neuronal populations and the neural responses. Um, and we think that this is really important for, um, for using these data and for the field in order to really be able to take, um, to really leverage these two tools for their different advantages, but still be able to relate these data to each other um, in an informed manner. So with that, I will uh, wrap up. I want to thank Paul Allen, our founder, for his vision, encouragement, and support. Um, and again, the entire Allen Institute for um, all of the work that has been done in creating these data, uh, and particularly Josh and Peter, who've done a lot of the work on this comparison, um, as well as our uh, the, the rest of our team that's been contributing to this. Great. Thank you very much, Saskia. Thank you for the excellent talk. Uh, okay, uh, I see there is one question in the queue. If there are more questions, please please write them into the SASP question window. So a question from Alex Dimitrov. Um, Saskia, why don't you image calcium faster than 30 hertz? Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's the, the current limitation, at least for the, the microscopes that we use. Um, I know that there are some methods that can image faster, and part of it has to do with the size of our field of view. So if we um, had a smaller field of view, we could get a, a, a higher scan rate. Um, but in order to, to record kind of the, the size of the population that we were looking to capture data from, um, the, the current technology kind of keeps us at, at 30 hertz. Um, so there are ways that that can get faster and that probably will get faster in the future, but um, this is kind of where we are right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, also another question. So um, what do you think we would need to fully reconcile the differences between this um, calcium imaging data and the uh, EFIS data? I mean, is that some kind of... Um, fundamental understanding that we are missing? Do we need maybe more experiments uh, with um, recordings from the same neuron with calcium imaging and spikes and other theoretical studies there? Yeah, so I think there's a couple of things. So, you know, Josh mentioned that they're developing neuropixel probes with um, a, a finer probe distance. So instead of 20 microns, they'll be, I think he said five microns apart, yeah. um, which will give kind of improve both the spatial resolution as well as probably the yield. Um, and so I think um, kind of getting denser recordings with EFIS um, might help um, for part of it. Um, but ultimately kind of as you just described, I think some joint recordings where we're imaging and recording simultaneously from the same cells. And those are really difficult experiments for a variety of reasons. And so I don't think that that's going to be a technique that can be used in a large scale. Um, but I think having more, uh, well, doing that and having you know some kind of calibration data sets in in that vein, I think would be really informative to this um, this work. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay. Well, um, thank you again, Saskia. That was great. Uh, thanks a lot. So that concludes our workshop. Um, just uh, maybe let me say a couple words here. I really appreciate uh, all the presentations from all the speakers. And uh, thanks also to all the attendees. Um, it was exciting three days. We hope that you had a good time and uh, learned something. And again, just to emphasize the main theme here is uh, that the Allen Institute has been producing and will continue producing very large standardized and uh, high quality data sets. Um, and we've seen some examples here already of how those data can be used for uh, computational studies, uh, modeling, theoretical uh, data analysis types of studies. And we want to encourage the community to look more into this data, use them in your day-to-day -day work and uh, give us feedback. Um, and we hope it will be, it will be uh, a good, resource continue to be a good resource for the community. 
All right, so with that, thanks everyone for your participation. Uh, special thanks to my co-organizers, uh, Saskia and Nuno, and to our wonderful communications team who was uh, running this whole thing and um, uh, did a great job. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day.